Act One of Brewster's Millions by Winchell Smith and Byron Ong Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Archibald Vanderpool, read by Alan Mapstone. Joseph McLeod, read by Greg Giordano. Frank Bragdon, read by Adrian Stevens. Napper Harrison, read by Andrew Kennedy. Mrs. Dan DeMille, read by Wendy Katzeller. Horace Pettingill, read by David Purdy. Subway Smith, read by Eli Bishop. Rick Cordray, reading Rawls. Barbara Drew, read by Michelle Hanna. Colonel Drew, read by Chad Jackson. Janice Armstrong, read by Lynette Calkins. Margaret Gray, read by Jen Broda. Montgomery Brewster, Monty, read by Matthew Reese. In Act One, and in Acts Two, Three, and Four, read by Krista Zaleski. Mr. Grant, read by Todd. Trixie Clayton, Read by T.J. Burns. First Boy, read by Todd. Second and Third Office Boy, read by Tricia G. Monsieur Bargie, read by Tricia G. Miss Boynton, read by Michelle Eaton. First Officer, read by Todd. Captain Perry, read by Zach Hoyt. Steward, read by David Purdy. Quartermaster read by Garrett Goodison. Sailor read by Brant Burgess. Bertram read by Step Heather. Stage directions read by T.R. Love. Act One Drawing Room in the Brewster Home. Act Two Monty Brewster's Business Offices in the Manhattan Bank Building. Act Three On Board the Auxiliary Yacht. Flitter in the Mediterranean Sea. Act 4. Monty Brewster's Home, just after the auction sale, September 23, 20 minutes of 12 noon. Brewster's Millions, Act 1. Scene represents drawing room of the house left Montgomery Brewster by his grandfather. Large arch on the left, showing glimpse of hall left, and stairway left upstage of arch portieres scene is oblique so as to form a triangle arch entrance right second to library table punch bowl right in arch off right second large hanging lamp center decorations with shields and spears on wall left upstage entrance table up right settee down right center Large ottoman, center, stepladder in front of portieres, at arch, left second. Two large chairs side by side, below arch, left, and left center. Discovered, Pettingill, on ladder, arranging portieres. Harrison, below him, holding curtain pins. Thomas, footman, holding ladder. Vanderpool, sitting left. McLeod, in library off right, mixing punch. Bragdon, right center, pulling cork from claret bottle. All in evening dress in this act except Monty. At rise, Vanderpool lazily watching Pettingill. Vanderpool, seated left center. Steady with the ladder, Thomas, or the little sons of the rich will suffer another loss. Mr. Pettingill is a valuable adjunct to the world of art, and it would be disappointing to bear him forth from the field of his labors on a shutter. Mac, turning to Vanderpool, right, mixing punch with coat off. Oh, shut up, Van. You lawyers should save your eloquence for the jury room. Resumes making punch. Nopper, offering curtain pin. Want another? No, thank you. Bragdon, crossing to Mac, with claret bottle open. Don't get the punch too heavy, Mac. 
Oh, I know enough not to make a longshoreman's drink. And remember, sunshine, go light on the rum and strong on the claret. This isn't a stack house warming. We don't want to stagger the ladies. Bragdon, Mac, and Nopper start for him. Gilly turns and slips down a step on ladder. Crash! This stops the others from mobbing Van for his awful pun. Vanderpool turns a little at commotion. Careful, Gilly. I don't want to be a prophet in my own country. Gilly descends ladder. Mac fills a punch glass and starts to Bragdon to taste it left. Bragdon, center, going a few steps toward Van. See here, Mr. Much Talk. Cut out a little of this monologue and do something. Help Max slice the oranges. Exit Thomas left with ladder. Don't ask him to do anything. Sees Mrs. DeMille, left center. I beg your pardon, Mrs. DeMille. Runs off right second for his coat, setting punch glass back on tray as he passes. Enter Mrs. DeMille from upstairs, going center. Is everything in good shape, Mrs. DeMille? <laughs> yes, indeed. Monty has a beautiful home here. Turns right center. Thanks to the efforts of the little sons of the rich. A little bow from all the boys in acknowledgement. You have done marvels with the house, Mr. Pettengill. Thank you. Chili never had a chance to spread himself before. You see... When Monty was called south, he gave me carte blanche to do as I pleased. Subby starts bad ragtime on piano, off right. And he does not know a thing of what you have done? Mac enters right. Vanderpool takes stage to center. Not a thing, Mrs. Dan. Petty has practically rebuilt the house. Harrison has engaged the servants, and Gardner is waiting at the station, ready to nab Monty and bring him here. Then we will all cheer him and sing Jolly Good Fellow at him. And after that, if he is disappointed, he will never have the nerve to say so. Mrs. DeMille sits right on sofa. He surely won't be disappointed. Music from piano, off right, very loud. Vanderpool takes a step up and looks off right. Say, can't somebody wake Subby up? He's having an awful dream in there. I'll wake him up. Exit right. I suppose he picked out the piano and wants to see how much it will stand. Music suddenly stops and there is a crash, off right. Mac, entering right. He stopped. Goes to Bragdon and Nopper, center. Subway Smith enters right, limping slightly and rubbing his knee. Sunshine, I suppose chucking me on the floor and breaking the piano stool was a tip that you could get along without my ragtime. Goes to Settee and sits beside Mrs. DeMille on her left. Did the tip hurt you? No, I like it. My kneecap is tickled to death. I was doping out the tempo of an opening chorus when Mac rang in the finale. You should save your musical outbursts until your songstress arrives. She's coming, isn't she? Trixie? Oh, she'll be here all right. You can't lose Trixie. Gee, I hope you'll like her, Mrs. Dan. I'm crazy about her voice. All she needs is a chance. Nopper crosses down center. Colonel Drew and his daughter are coming, are they not, Mrs. Dan? I invited them. And Janice Armstrong, too. She is visiting Barbara Drew, you know. Nopper rejoins Mac and Vanderpool. Oh, is Miss Strong Arm coming? You mustn't make fun of Janice. I'm very fond of her. Rises, crosses, right center. Oh, very well. Rises, crosses, up right to right center. Nopper, to Mrs. Dan, looking at watch... I hope they'll arrive soon. It's nearly time for Monty now. You'll be here promptly at 8.30. Why, Peggy, uh, Miss Gray, isn't here yet, is she? General buzz of conversation. Why, where is Peggy? She should be here now. 
There wouldn't be a housewarming without her. She must be here. I'm going over there and find out what's wrong. How much time have I, Nopper? About twelve minutes. I can make it. Exit left. I can't see why she isn't here. Peggy, of all people. Rawls enters left, announcing. Colonel Drew, Miss Drew, Miss Armstrong. Ah, Barbara. Barbara enters left, nods to Mrs. Dan, crossing to Vanderpool. We are so sorry to be late. Papa was detained at the bank. We simply rushed through dinner. Ah, Colonel. Colonel enters, crosses right. Ah, good evening. Janice enters left, crosses left center, and speaks. Hello, hello, hello. Mrs. Dan crosses down, meets Janice, center. I'm awfully glad you came, Janice. I'm glad to be here, but I don't know the game. Tell a fellow about it. We're giving our young friend Monty Brewster a housewarming and surprise party. Vanderpool quietly indicating Janice by look right. Subby, who is that fellow? Subby turns right. That's old chap Armstrong. She's all right, only she has ideas and tries to be a good fellow, and that handicaps her some. Yes, she looks good to me. Crosses upright and to Mrs. Dan at Ottoman. It's all too sweet for words. Why don't you look about you, Janice? Mrs. Dan goes up to Ottoman, sits. Janice, crossing around chairs left, looking the place all over as she goes to down left. I have looked, old girl. Seems all right to me. Not insistently millionaireish, naturally conceived, color scheme quite the thing, and all considered, rings true. How's everything in Boston? Wrong as usual, Subby Smith. I'm from Chicago. All laugh slightly at this. Subby crosses back to Barbara. Why, Archie, you don't mean to say you don't know Miss Armstrong. I know of Miss Armstrong. They come down a step. Miss Armstrong, let me present one of our rising young attorneys, Mr. Archibald Vanderpool. He beams, crosses to her to make the speech of his life. Her hearty grip takes it all out of him. How are you? Delighted to know you, Miss Armstrong. The little sons of the rich are proud and honored to have you participate in our housewarming. Please tell me, like a good fellow, who are the little sons of the rich? We are a band of eight. I'll give attention. We call ourselves the little sons of the rich because although there is a fortune hanging somewhere about each of our family trees, no one of us is worth a dollar. You mean was worth a dollar. Fortune, to the extent of a million dollars, has smiled upon our ringleader, Monty Brewster. Behold us awaiting his return. He pirouettes and crosses up center. Vanderpool continues, a disgusted look at Subby. And now the little sons of the rich are congregated for the last time. Mrs. Dan on Ottoman Center. Why for the last time? The spell is broken. After tonight, the little sons of the rich will be but a memory. Well, we won't cry about it. Vanderpool turns to Janice. Colonel, crossing down right center to center with Nopper. It's a great pleasure to me to a figure in Montgomery's good fortune. Monty deserves all the luck that comes to him or ever may come. By the way, where is Miss Peggy? Turns to Barbara. Who is Miss Peggy? Why, Miss Peggy Gray, my dear. Oh, of course. Mr. Brewster used to live in her mother's boarding house, didn't he? Her inflection has just the slightest possible disparaging insinuation. Nopper, quietly but very positively correcting her. Monty shared Mrs. Gray's home from childhood, Miss Drew. He's all that a son could be to her. Is she going to be here to share in his surprise? We believe so. 
Mac enters left, left center. Knopper? Yes? Just a moment, please. Will you excuse me, Colonel? Mac and Knopper exit left. Certainly. To Subby. Smith, I like that young man. Who is he? That, Colonel, is Knopper Harrison, the most gentle, sober-minded, and withal business-like fellow in America. Mont's his weakness. Mrs. Dan rises and starts to cross right. Barbara stops her. Don't you think, Mrs. Dan, it's rather too bad to have a great luxurious home like this go to waste on a bachelor? Mac and Knopper enter left and hear this. As bachelors, Miss Drew, the little sons of the rich resent the word waste. We, we do. do. Extravagant bow, all but Mac. I abjectly beg the poor bachelor's pardon. <laughs> Laughs and curtsies. I think perhaps Monty has hopes, Miss Drew. Sits on chair by Janice. Oh, indeed. Boys, except Vanderpool, gather around Mrs. Dan up left. One of them is telling a story in pantomime. Papa? Yes, my dear. What is it? Barbara crosses to him. Don't forget. What, my dear? Barbara, just enough meaning to have it detected. Ask Mr. Brewster to dinner tomorrow night. Of course, I intend to do that. General laugh from bunch up left. Janice left, seated. I mean temperamental. You are quite temperamental, aren't you? Yes, but not sentimental. I see. Yes, that's the main argument in my new book, The Higher Demonstration of Platonism. What do you demonstrate? Janice, front. I bear the torch of friendship, which lights the way to a thorough understanding between the sexes, good fellowship without ulterior motives, handshakes without a lingering caress, er... Greetings on the eyebrow rather than on the lips. Your understanding is captivating, dear boy. I should say invigorating, according to Platonism. Janice, rising. I stand corrected. We shall be pals. Offers her hand. Vanderpool rises and takes it. Thanks, old chap. Nopper starts down center. Let's get away from the women where we can smoke. Crosses around chair and up left. Vanderpool follows. Nopper starts to cross center. Rawls enters left. Mr. Harrison, Mr. Brewster just telephoned that he will arrive in three minutes. All right, Rawls. Let us know the moment he drives up. Yes, sir. Exit left. General buzz of talk and movement. Mac. Right, with tray and punch glasses filled. Make room for the punch. General exclamation from all. He crosses left at back and down left. Subby gets his, then Nopper, Vanderpool, Janice, then Mrs. DeMille, Barbara, Colonel, etc. As dialogue continues, Barbara crosses down right center. Oh, I'm so excited. Subby coming down to her. I don't see why you're excited, Miss Drew. Millionaires are no novelty to you. Mrs. Dan hears as she is crossing left and stops center. A nice boy falling heir to a million is always an excitement to everybody. She meets Mac center and takes punch. Thank you, Mrs. Dan. We ought to receive him with applause and speeches. Now, in my opera, when the tenor comes in, Oh, oh Subby, please, 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 please don't. Oh, Subby, please don't. Mac, crossing right. Oh, cut it out, Sub. I've heard nothing but that opera of yours for two months. Colonel takes punch and crosses to left center to Nopper. Subby, won't you pose us? Subby is just taking punch, replaces it on tray. With pleasure. Crosses center. Mrs. Dan, will you stand by the staircase, please? She takes her place up left. And Mac? Mac, replacing tray on table right. Yes? 
you do the adoring at her feet. What? Then I'll do it myself. Goes to Mrs. Dan, kneels at her feet, punch glass, etc. All right, stay there and keep quiet. Now, Colonel Drew, right over here, please, by the sofa. Seppi goes up right center for Colonel and escorts him to his place. Colonel takes place. That's it. How are you going to pose me? How does this look? Puts his arm on Barbara's shoulder. No, no. This is not a daguerreotype, Colonel. It's 1924. Oh. Subby, turning. Nopper, nopper. Oh, all right. You're all right. Save a place for Peggy Gray. Heavens, we can't do this surprise without her. Bragg will get her here if she's alive. Now, Miss Armstrong, right up here, please. Indicating up center. Miss Armstrong goes up center. And Van, you keep her company. Vanderpool follows. Mac, uh, you and I by the punch. Now, fine. Now, everyone raise their glasses when Monty comes in. Just a moment. I have an idea. Runs down center. Everyone moves and speaks to him. That's oh, awesome. Subby. That's that your idea. idea. Oh, Subby, oh, that's Subby. your idea. Really? Etc., etc. Hold your places. Oh, keep quiet. Pushes Subby back, trying to quiet him. Gives it up and crosses right to Mac and takes punch. Subby takes place center where Mac was. Just a moment, please. Comes back down center. What I wanted to say was, this is in my opera. When the tenor comes in, they all raise their glasses and say, Hail to the king. Now, all together, Hail to the king. Hail to the king. Hail to the king. Subby goes up center in disgust. Rotten. Why not be natural? Let's just drink to him and say, Welcome home. Oh, all right. Just as you say. Now, all together, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome, welcome, home. welcome, welcome home. home. Peggy enters left, just in time to get the benefit of this. She makes a curtsy and says, Thank you. Peggy at last. 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 Late Miss Gray. Etc., etc. Mrs. Dan comes to her center. Why, Peggy Gray, where have you been? Peggy turns to her. Am I late? No, but you're only just in time. Enter Bragdon, left. Psst! Monty has just driven up to the door. Uh, quick, Miss Gray, over here, and Bragg, down by Miss Drew. Peggy crosses right second. Mac gives her punch. Bragdon crosses right first. Now, quiet, everyone. Out go the lights, and when they go up, we'll all raise our glasses and say, Welcome home! Harrison turns off switch and lights go out. All lights must be cut out simultaneously. Stage, house, orchestra, etc., leaving faint moonlight. Blue strip on floor, off left window. Quiet pause. Careful, Subby, you'll make me spill my punch. Why, Mr. Vanderpool. <laughs> Shh. I've forgotten what to say. Welcome, Welcome home. home. Welcome, Welcome home. home. Welcome home. Slam of door outside. Shh. Monty off stage left. Cheerful, ain't it, Rawls? Where are my servants? Can't a millionaire have lights in his own house? Rawls off left. Go right in that way. I'll attend to the lights. It's easy enough for you to say, go right in that way, Rawls, but you can't see your hand before you. Enters left. It's black as ink around here. I always hate to go into a dark room. It reminds me of that story about the girl in the Turkish bath. Rawls enters left. Shut up, old man. When they turn the lights on. Shut up, I tell you. Monty comes down left, stumbles over Ottoman. Damn! As if afraid of dark. Rawls, where are you? I'm here. Let's get out of this tomb and go home. You are home. I mean Peggy's home. This infernal place gives me the shivers already. 
Lights? Lights full up. Rawls takes Monty's hat and coat and crosses left, all rushing down and forming a half circle about Monty. Well, welcome, welcome, home. Home. Welcome, welcome home. home! Welcome home! Welcome home! Welcome home! One moment, please. Here's prosperity, health, and happiness to Montgomery Brewster. Speech, speech, Monty. Monty. Speech, 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 speech, Monty. Speech, Monty. Etc. I do believe in fairies. I do, I do, I do. Peter Pan business. <laughs> if my heart doesn't stop beating, I'll try to tell you how much I appreciate this. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't make a speech. Oh, yes, yes you, you can. can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, you can. Try it. Try it. Try it. Yes, you can. Come on, Monty. Go ahead. Do it. Etc. But let me assure you that you will always be as welcome here as you made me feel tonight. Good boy, Monty. Monty shakes hands with all around the circle. First Knopper, Colonel, Mrs. Dan, Subby, Vanderpool, Janice, Bragdon, Mac. Fine. Fine. Great. 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 Wonderful. That was wonderful. Fine. Great. You should see the decorations. Hello, Monty, old boy. Congratulations, Mr. Brewster. How do you do? Sees Peggy as he gets to Barbara and forgets he started to shake Barbara's hand. Crosses at once to Peggy. Peggy, I'm so glad to see you again. It's good to have you home, Monty. Thomas Bright Center is collecting the punch glasses during this as greetings are exchanged. Each turns up and places glass on tray. Rawls, center, has entered left and comes down left of Monty. Uh, beg pardon, sir. Monty sees Rawls for first time. Is that mine, too? He's your butler. Oh. Crosses to him, center. I have a message for you, sir. Would you mind telling me your name? Rawls, sir. Thank you. Isn't this a rather peculiar time for a message, Rawls? Uh, beg pardon, sir. I fear it's very urgent. Oh, very well. Let's have it. Mr. Grant, of Grant and Ripley, has called repeatedly, sir. I informed him that you would arrive this evening. He will return at nine o'clock. He states that his business is of vital importance and will admit of no delay. Who the deuce are Grant and Ripley? Rawls, handing Monty card. His card, sir. Attorneys at law. Well, Rawls, if you don't mind, when Mr. Grant calls, say that I have guests tonight, and I am busy. If it is very urgent, I will see him tonight. Yes, sir. Crosses left. Monty, center. And Rawls? Rawls stops and turns, left center. Yes, sir. I'm very much obliged to you, I'm sure. Subby comes down center, watching this. Rawls exits left. Monty watches him, then turns on Subby's laugh. <laughs> you seem afraid of your butler, Monty. I am, Subby, but I'm trying not to show it. Oh, Monty. Hello. I've invited a singer to do a little warbling for us tonight. One of your hidden geniuses? Fine or super fine? Super. Miss Trixie Clayton. Not the chorus girl. Oh, it's all right. She won't mind. She won't. She's all right. I, I told Mrs. Dan about it, and she said to have her come. All right, Sub. Don't let it worry you. I'm not objecting, you know. I just wanted to tell you, that's all. He goes up center. Monty joins Peggy right. Peggy, tell me. Barbara, going to Monty and taking his arm. Now we are going to show you over the house, Mr. Brewster. Monty, about to refuse in favor of Peggy. Peggy goes up, and Monty, after noticing it... Why, certainly. Subby, Subby, lead the way, will you? All right, this way, everybody. General chatter from all. Exit Omnis right. Accepting Peggy. Peggy goes down to chair left, sits. Mrs. Dan is last, is about to exit, sees Peggy, goes back to her. I think I'll stay with you, Peggy, if you don't mind. Of course. Mrs. Dan sits. We've seen the house from top to bottom already. Monty certainly was surprised, wasn't he? Peggy stares straight ahead, lost in thought. 
I hope he will be as pleased with the whole house as he seemed to be with these rooms. Don't you? Peggy recovering herself. Of course. I should be lonesome living in such a big house by myself. I do hope he will be happy here. I hope everything good and beautiful will be Monty's in this new life. Just as it was in the old life. Peggy looking curiously at Mrs. Dan. What do you mean? The good and beautiful influence he has had about him ever since he has lived in your mother's home. Monty doesn't need any influence to keep him straight. Mrs. Dan, getting a little close to Peggy. He needs you and your mother now more than ever. But his circumstances are so different now, with this fortune and a position to keep up. Why, even these two months he has been away, everything seems changed. Of course. And there will be another change soon, Peggy. Soon. Depend on it. Peggy looks at Mrs. Dan questioningly. Mrs. Dan looks archly at Peggy. Oh, I see. You mean he'll marry? Naturally, I hope he'll find a nice girl. So do I. She looks at Peggy. May I ask you a question, Peggy? Why, of course. Why didn't you write to him while he was away? I did. How often? Often enough. He didn't think so. What makes you think he didn't? Mrs. Dan, smiling. You should have seen the letter I had from him. I had to make Dan read the beginning over twice before I could believe it was for me. It was all Peggy, 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 crisscrossed, underscored, and down the sides. Five pages of questions about you, with two references to ourselves. First, how was Mr. Dan? Second, how was... Enter Monty, right, goes to Mrs. Dan. Mrs. Dan, Subby is looking for you. He has his genius in there and doesn't seem to know what to do with her. May I take you to him? Peggy remains seated. Thank you, no. Looking from one to the other. The call of genius is enough for me. I know where to find him. Exits right. Peggy rises when Mrs. Dan indicates she is going to leave them alone. She and Monty exchange looks, and she starts to run across to exit right. As she passes above Monty's center, he catches her. Just a moment, please. I want about five years' conversation with you, miss. Indicates Satie right. You come here and sit down. You're getting a big girl now. You mustn't run around the house like that. He seats her in right corner of Satie. Five years' conversation with you? Rises immediately. But you must look over the house first. You haven't half seen it, I'm sure. Monty receipts her gently. Oh, the house can wait. Tell me, how's Mother, well? Of course she is. Monty looks Peggy over critically. Gee, you look pretty tonight, Peggy. When do you get the new dress? Peggy, sitting. It isn't new. You've seen it twenty times. I did my best with it, in honor of this momentous occasion. How did you like the welcome we gave the returning prodigal? Monty sits. I felt more like the fatted calf. It was fine of the fellows, though, wasn't it? I've heard a lot of nonsense lately about not needing friends when you have money, but I tell you... When I think of the friendship of Nopper and Bragg and grouchy old Mac, it makes this old million of mine seem mighty small in comparison. I'm glad your money hasn't changed you, Monty. Changed me? Looks at her searchingly a moment. You seem to be the changed one. Peggy looking at him quickly. How absurd! How could your money change me? I don't know. But it mustn't, Peggy. It mustn't. Why, if I thought this blessed million could make a difference, come between us, I mean, I'd give it away so quick it would make your head swim. Peggy, very sincerely and simply, just touch his hand. It won't make any difference with me, Monty, ever. Think of the splendid opportunity this fortune gives you to prove what a man you are. Your grandfather's memory should always mean a great deal to you. Oh, I'm not so very grateful. 
he couldn't take his money with him. Oh, I appreciate it all, but I happen to remember that my mother didn't have a very easy time of it while she lived. If some of these luxuries could have gone to her, I... Oh, what's the good of talking about it? He sits. Beautiful home, isn't it? Yes, very beautiful. Something wrong with it. What? It isn't home. You know what, Peggy? Our home. Your home and mother's home. Now, I'm going to keep my room in the little house, and every once in a while... Peggy rises suddenly. Monty, you must join your friends. You've been away too long now. They will notice it. Subby, running to center. Sorry to disturb you, old man, but we are ready for the singing. Enter Rawls, left. Aren't you coming? All right, Subby, go ahead. We'll be there in a moment. All right, but hurry. Exit Bright. Beg pardon, sir, but Mr. Grant would like to see you for a few moments, if possible. Monty crosses to Rawls. Grant? Who's Grant? Uh, the gentleman that called so often to see you, sir. Oh, that lawyer chap? Yes, sir. Monty, turning to Peggy. Tell him I'm busy. I beg your pardon? Monty turns to Rawls. You told me to say that you would see him if his business could not wait. Did I? Well, I apologize to you, Mr. Rawls, but I've changed my mind. No, Monty, you must see him if you've promised. Show Mr. Grant in, Rawls. Rawls looks at Monty. Yes, miss. Exits left. Peggy, this is ever so much more important. I want to tell you something that means everything in the world to me. Oh, Monty, not now. Why, don't you want to hear it? How can I tell when I don't know what you are going to say? But you do know. You must know. Why, Peggy, every moment since... Peggy crosses right. I'm going to hear the singing. Well, Peggy, I want to see you for a moment. Peggy, at exit right, stops, turns. Oh, Monty, wait. How long? Until he's gone. Laughs and exits quickly. But Peggy... Rawls enters left. Mr. Grant. Exit. Grant, entering left, crossing center. Mr. Brewster? Monty, advancing, shaking hands. Yes, sir. Won't you sit down? Indicates settee right, then looks off right again. Grant, sitting right and taking from his pocket a number of documents. I am Mr. Grant, of Grant and Ripley, attorneys. I dislike bothering you with business tonight exceedingly but it is necessary to put a proposition before you and get your decision out to montana tomorrow morning monty bringing down chair montana my decision has a long and rapid journey ahead of it sits right center james t sedgwick died september twenty third in butte montana died in butte i should think he would how does his death concern me? Grant looks at Monty reprovingly. He was your uncle, sir, your mother's brother. My uncle? Trying to recall him. I think I remember hearing something about an uncle when I was a boy. We have just received a most astonishing communication from the executor of your uncle's will, Mr. Swearingen Jones. Who? Swearingen Jones. What does swear again say? You, Mr. Brewster, are your uncle's sole heir. Monty, looking quickly at Grant. I? You. Much money? Seven millions. Monty sits motionless, grasping the seat of his chair, and stares at Grant. After a pause, he swallows, speaks as if to himself as if he had not grasped the meaning of the words. Seven millions? Seven mil? Gets up suddenly and goes to Bell. What will you have? Thank you. I don't drink. Will you have a cigar? Coming back with sudden doubt. It was, did you say, s s seven millions? 
It is nearly that amount, yes. It's my mistake, my mistake. I just thought perhaps I might have misunderstood you. My relatives seem to be dying just to make me money mad. It may be like that. Monty, looking quickly at him. What? There is a proviso. A proviso? Sighs. Now I'm going to wake up. Before you can get this money, you must spend every dollar of the fortune you now possess. That's easy. I am not so certain. Why? Grant, holding up copy of will. There are restrictions embraced herein. Oh. Sits watching Grant intently, not in an easy attitude, but erect and alert. Grant, opening will and looking through it during speech. I will give you a brief outline of the will, and if you decide to accept the conditions, we can go over it fully tomorrow in my office. Puts on glasses. <coughs> Your uncle bequeaths and devises all his property, real and personal, to you. Pause and looks at Monty and continues. On September 23rd next, which is the 26th anniversary of your birthday, you are to meet Swearingen Jones at any place you may name in the city of New York at 12 o'clock noon. Said Jones will then turn over to you all interest mentioned in the inventory which accompanies this will. If, to his full satisfaction, you have faithfully complied with the following supreme conditions, that you come into your twenty-sixth birthday with a fair name and your habits temperate, that you have proved to the executor your ability to manage your affairs shrewdly and wisely, that you take no person or persons into your confidence regarding this will or its conditions, and that upon the date named you have completely and entirely dissipated your fortune and have kept an accurate and correct account of all your expenditures, and meet the executor absolutely penniless, with no worldly possessions other than the clothes which cover you, with no article of jewelry, furniture, or finance, which you may call your own, or thereafter reclaim. In a word, with no visible or invisible asset. Arranges paper. Well, what do you think of it? Monty replaces chair upright. I think it's a joke. Who wrote it? Grant rises. You will find it is no joke. Handing Monty a document, that statement enumerates your uncle's holdings and their value. You will find there's not a bad penny in all those millions. Monty crosses to center. Monty looking over list. Has the will been probated? No. Why not? Your uncle requested that the will should not be probated or made public for one year. Oh. Sits. Busy with papers. Here is a telegram from Jones, with positive restrictions noted. Hands Monty telegram. Monty, reading. Heir must under no circumstances take anyone into his confidence. Here are the rules I want him to work by. No indiscriminate giving away of funds. Don't be stingy, though. I hate a stingy man. No more than ordinary dissipations, but I hate a saint. No excessive donations to charity. Let him spend his money freely, but get his money's worth. Above everything else, no matrimonial entanglements. Damn sure this would disturb confidence and wife might prove invisible asset. Um. Thinks a moment, puts his hands in his pockets, walks slowly from table in thought, then comes back quickly, faces Grant. If I accept, I must carry out these ridiculous conditions to the full satisfaction of Jones? Yes. And if, by September 23rd next, I've spent all this money and Jones doesn't happen to be full of satisfaction? Looks at Grant. Puts telegram in pocket. Just where would I get off? Get off? Yes. Alight. Arrive. Be. Come in. 
no article of jewelry, furniture, or finance, visible or invisible wife, or asset. I'd be in a cute little position now, wouldn't I? Crosses center. Grant rises. You must be the judge of whether you wish to try for this money or not. I'm glad to hear that. Swearington Jones is himself a very rich man, and we know him to be fair and honorable. He was your uncle's closest friend, and his desire is to carry out his wishes to the letter. Monty turns. Why all this secrecy? Probably because your uncle did not want your friends to either help or hinder you. Monty, crossing to him, giving paper back. Well, please tell Swearingen Jones that I'll hold on to what I have. Crosses left, stops left center, turns. Was Uncle James always crazy, or did it come on him late in life? There is no doubt, I think, as to your uncle's sanity. Then why was he so keen on having me spend all my grandfather's money? Because he hated your grandfather above everything in life. Monty, looking squarely and keenly at Grant. Why? Your father married against the wishes of his parents, and for that reason your grandfather disinherited him and turned him into the streets. Your grandfather blamed your mother, and even after the death of your father, allowed you and your mother to want for the necessities of life. And you, young as you were, may not remember that he practically allowed your mother to die of starvation. Monty stares straight in front of him, then looks at Grant again. Do you know this to be true? I do. I also know that shortly before her death, your mother induced your uncle, then only a poor young man, to leave the city, fearing he would kill your grandfather if he remained. And before my uncle died, he knew that my grandfather had left me his money? Evidently. And it was his idea that what my mother wasn't fit for isn't fit for me. Exactly. Is it possible to obtain any proof? You are prepared to give me proof that my grand, that this man treated my mother as you say he did? I am prepared to show you positive proof. Monty takes a couple of steps upright, turns, takes Grant's hand. Mr. Grant, I'll take that on contract. Monty takes envelope and pencil from his pocket and figures rapidly during the following. Grant, collecting his papers and rising. Very good. I fear you will find your task somewhat difficult. You will have to spend something like $3,000 a day. Monty, still figuring on an envelope. Yes, but for every 3000 I spend, I get 20000 in return. I will really be making about 17000 Gee, my head is going round already. Good night, Mr. Brewster. Allow me to wish you luck. Thank you. I hope you'll win. Goes up left center. Yes, I'll be going some. At what time will you be at my office tomorrow? Monty turns. 6.30. Grant smiles. I think nine will do. Good night. Exit left. Good night. Oh, Mr. Mr. Runs off, up left, talks off left. When you write to Jones, ask him not to think of any new conditions. I think now it's about time for that drink. Touches bell left. Spend $3,000 a day. Center, figuring again on envelope. No, more than that. Interest coming in all the time. Enter Rawls right. Did you ring, sir? Yes. Bring me $3,000 a day. Give me 5%. Oh, give me a scotch and soda. Figures again rapidly. Yes, sir. Exit right. 5%. 1 million. No, 4. I can't get it down to that. 4%. Still figuring. Peggy, entering right... Stands inside the conservatory archway. Has he gone? Monty, looking up preoccupied, goes on to himself, still looking at envelope. How the deuce did he make it 3000 a day? Who? 
I must have a bookkeeper. I can see that now. What? Grant can beat me at figures. Studies envelope closely. What are you talking about, Monty? Monty, suddenly realizing mistake. I wonder if he included Sundays. Am I intruding? Monty, paying attention for the first time. Why, of course. Oh, excuse me. Cross is right. Monty sees her. Oh, I beg your pardon, Peggy. I beg your pardon. I am sorry to interrupt you, Monty, but you asked me to come back. Huh? Asked you? Oh, yes. Turns around, puts pencil and envelope in pocket, crosses to her. Listen, Peggy, I want to tell you something that means everything in the world to me. Ever since I've been away, I've been thinking about this, and tonight. And when I saw you, I made up my mind to ask you. Peggy, dear, I want you to be my... Stops. No matrimonial entanglements. Crosses center. The fact is, Peggy, I'm going into business, and I've got to begin right away. What sort of business? It's a peculiar kind of business. I can't explain it exactly. I don't think anybody ever tried it before. Isn't this all rather sudden? Sudden? It's the suddenest thing you ever heard of. You see, there's a referee and a proviso and an uncle and a Jones and a man named Butte and... Oh, gee, what am I talking about? I don't know what you're talking about, but I wish you luck from the bottom of my heart. Crosses and gives him her hand, Monty taking her hand. Thank you, Peggy. You're a dear. All applaud off stage. Enter Subby Wright with Miss Trixie Clayton, Mac, Bragdon, followed by Mrs. Dan and Nopper. General buzz of conversation. I knew you could do it. Oh, Monty, I want you to know Miss Clayton, and she's going to be a star someday, sure. Monty bows abstractedly. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid that's a long way off, Mr. Brewster. Oh, I hope not. I'm only in the chorus now. Two others. But Mr. Smith is doing all he can to make me a principal. Mac, to Monty. Say, Monty, don't pay any attention to Subby. What's the matter? Why, aren't you on? No. He's trying to get you to star that Miss Clayton in his opera. Now, you know what happened to Tommy Burt when he tried to make a star of that Millie Milton. No. Why, he lost $60,000 before he woke up, and he's paying bills yet. On the level? Crossing to Miss Clayton left. May I see you a moment before you go? I won't detain you a moment. Boys, Napper, Bragg, Mac, come here. I have a great scheme. I'm going into business, and I want you all to come with me. When? What kind of business Where? is it, Monty? When does it happen? Etc. Exit Mrs. Dan and Peggy. Trixie and Subby upstage left to put on wraps. Rawls enters right with drink, stands back of settee. I can't explain it just now, but it will need the services of all you fellows. Now, let me think. Napper, I want you to be my general superintendent of affairs. Bragg, private secretary. Mac, financial secretary. Takes drink. I need a lawyer. Van, you're the counsel. Isn't this room a little warm? Takes drink from him, returns it to Rawls, who exits right. No, on the level, Van. I'm in earnest. Enter Colonel, Janice, and Barbara right. But, but Monty, Monty, what do you mean? What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? What are you talking about? What do you, what's 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 what do you mean? Etc. I haven't time to talk about it now. All in favor say aye. The ayes have it. I'll see you at twelve o'clock tomorrow. The boys exit right, talking in pantomime. Colonel Center. Monty, we must say good night. Thank you. I mean, much obliged. Er, that is, must you go? Yes, I must. I have another chapter to finish in my book. Have you written a book? Yes, The Higher Demonstration of Platonism. Really? Your first effort? It isn't an effort. I believe all I write. Ah, but do your readers? I don't know. I haven't a publisher yet, and probably never shall have. 
Platonism is a dead issue with the common herd. I see. Turning to Barbara. She means they won't buy her book. Turning suddenly to Miss Armstrong. I'll publish your book. You, Mr. Brewster. Yes. Will you be good enough to let me see you about it tomorrow? I want to talk to you. Thank you so much. Will you do us the honor to dine with us tomorrow evening? Thank you. Yes, I shall be delighted. Certainly. Oh, no. I forgot. I'm giving a dinner tomorrow. I have to give dinners every night for a year. I mean, I want you and Miss Drew to dine with me, if you will, Colonel. And you too, Miss Armstrong. I'll send my machine for you. But, Monty, I didn't know you had a car. I haven't. I'm going to buy some. Some? Some? Why some? Well, you see, I want to ride every day. Crosses right center. Colonel, Barbara, and Janice cross left. Oh, Colonel, just a moment. Barbara and Janice exit left. Yes? Stops left center. Are there offices vacant in the Manhattan Bank building? I don't know. Why? I want to engage them. I'm going into business and I shall... Seeing Trixie with Subby. Excuse me, please. Miss Clayton, won't you sit down, please? Thank you. Sits on settee right. Run away, Subby. Colonel and Subby exit left. Miss Clayton? Sitting beside her. I'm going to make a star actress out of you. Star? <sighs> me. Mac, Nopper, and Van enter right with coats, etc., and stand about right and right center, center. Just a minute, please. I think you have the most wonderful voice I've ever heard. Slight business for Trixie. Monty continues rapidly. Peggy and Mrs. Dan enter left with wraps. Nopper joins Peggy center. And Subby Smith tells me he has a great comic opera with a wonderful part in it for you. Now all you need is preparation. The first thing for us to do is to engage a bunch of singing teachers, dancing masters, and stage managers. Then I must buy you some gowns and jewels and brooches and pins. You must have lots of carriages and automobiles. Well, my friend Mr. Gardner will act as your manager and arrange a bank account for you. Thank you so much for waiting. I'll tell you all about it tomorrow. Rises, offers hand. Peggy overhears part of this from left center. Trixie, rising, taking both Monty's hands. Mr. Brewster, you've made me the happiest girl in the world. Yes, isn't that nice of me? There is a pause and look between Trixie and Peggy as Trixie crosses up left center. Subby and the colonel enter left and talk to Trixie, turning to Mrs. Dan. Oh, Mrs. Dan, I'm giving a dinner tomorrow night, and of course I want you and Dan to come. And next week, I'm giving some more dinners and a fancy dress ball. In fact, I'm going to do a lot of things, and I want to consult you. Thank you so much. Turns up center. Oh, Nopper. Sees Peggy, leaves Mrs. Dan. Mrs. Dan goes up left. Seeing Peggy, center, with wraps, stops. Why, Peggy, you're not going. Yes. Good night. Exits left. Monty steps left. Well, mayn't I take you home? Mrs. Dan intervenes. Peggy's going home with me, Monty. Exits left. Well, I know, but... Well, good night, Monty. Good night, Nopper, old man. Looks after Peggy, who is going off left with Mrs. Dan. Many happy returns of the day, old chap. Good, good night, night. Good, good night, night Monty. Monty. Take it easy. Ad lib. The boys all exit left saying good night and shaking hands with Monty left as they exit. Good night, good night. Oh, boys. Boys off stage. Yes, yes. what? Etc. Remember, 12 o'clock sharp. All, All right, right, we'll be there. there. Good, good night, night. what's night. missing? Etc. Good night, good night. Goes to chair left, sits, reading telegram, no indiscriminate giving away of funds. Don't be stingy, though. I hate a stingy man. Enter Rawls. I beg pardon, sir. Is there anything else I can do tonight? No, thank you. Rawls crosses right center. Oh, Rawls. Yes, sir. How long have you been with me? Two days, sir. 
Monty crosses to him. Two days. You've been a very good and faithful servant. I'll double your wages. And Rawls? Yes, sir. Get me a taxi. Are you going out tonight, sir? Monty, seated on Ottoman Center. No, I have an engagement at 9.30 in the morning. Tell the chauffeur to wait. Yes, sir. Exit Rawls right. Curtain. First picture, Monty on Ottoman figuring. Call. Full company. End of Act One. Act Two of Brewster's Millions by Winchell Smith and Byron Only. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene, represents the interior of the office of Monty Brewster, the Bank of Manhattan Island building, door up left center, office doors in right in second and third, doors half glass, on door down right first, secretary's office is written, and counsel. On door right second, private secretary and financial secretary. A large library desk with swivel chair back of it, center. Auxiliary desk down left. Small chair in front of desk. Armchairs down left. Small table with telephone by entrance door upper left center. Large safe up center. Hat rack upper right center. Ticker down right first entrance. Telephone on desk, center. Office, very handsomely furnished. Typewriter on desk, center left side. Arch, up right center, showing cashier's window, up left. Bleaked, across corner. Office building, backing. One telephone, two blotter pads, three typewriters, four or five ashtrays, an inkstand with pen holder, etc., in gilt. Six checkbooks. Stage full up white foots, first border and side lights, white strips all entrances, amber mediums through window up left. At rise, ticker, phone bell rings, ding, ding, ding. First boy lifts up receiver. Ah, shut up. Second boy enters right first. Where is Mr. Harrison? Lunch. Allison and Co. want him to call them up as soon as he comes in. All right. Harrison enters up left center, coat and hat. First boy speaks as Harrison is halfway to ticker, sitting up immediately and putting novel away. Allison and company want you to call them up as soon as you come in. Get them. Goes quickly to the ticker. First boy, speaking into telephone on desk, Left center, switchboard supposed to be outside. Get Allison and company. Harrison at ticker. Ticker stops on phone bell. Looking along tape. Takes a quick sharp breath. Takes off coat and hat. Hands them to boy who has followed him down. Takes them into superintendent office. Phone bell rings. Harrison goes to desk center and uses phone. Hello. Allison and company? Is that you, Allison? Looks to see if there is anyone in office. This is Harrison. Yes. Yes. I've seen the quotation. Well, I won't protect it any further. If it goes down to 58, I'm wiped out. I hope so. Goodbye. He hangs up phone. First boy enters right first. Crosses to his desk. McLeod enters from financial secretary's office. Bills and checks in his hand. Starts for superintendent office. Sees Harrison. Mac goes to him. I thought you were out. Will you sign these checks? Hands check to Harrison, who is staring front right center and does not heed Mac for a moment. Suddenly turning, looks at Mac takes checks absently, looks over them, takes up pen, signs them during the following. He sits left of Monty's desk, right center. Knopper, are you in love? 
What put that in your head? When a man goes mooning about, as you have for the last week, and doesn't half hear what's said to him, it's a mighty good sign that he has a lovely woman on the brain. <laughs> it isn't love. I wish it were. Ticker. I was thinking. That's all. Up to Ticker. Mac looks after him. The last thing any of Monty Brewster's staff wants to do is to think. Look at that check for Tiffany. Twenty-seven thousand dollars for favors for this confounded ball. I tell you, Nopper, it's sickening. Bragdon enters quickly from private secretary's office with a copy of The Trumpet in his hand. He comes slowly, speaking as he comes. Say, have you fellows seen the censor slap at Monty in this week's trumpet? Ticker stops. I do many foolish things, but I don't read the trumpet. You don't, eh? Well, listen to this. Reads. Not content with having staggered society with his recent sensational dinner, young Monty Brewster has issued invitations to a Viennese ball to take place at Sherry's on the 20th. Ever since this young man has inherited his millions, he has been the target of humorists of every club in town. Because of his lavishness in entertaining, his recklessness in business ventures, and indiscriminate method in getting rid of his newly acquired wealth, it is thought that young Brewster hopes, by his attitude of magnificence, to dazzle Miss Barbara Drew, the daughter of the executor of his grandfather's will. There will be little or no surprise if an interesting announcement is made on the evening of the ball. The comments going the rounds concerning the spectacular career of Mr Brewster are causing considerable concern to his real friends, while the improvident young man's methods are proving a genuine joy to his grafting associates. Looks. That's us. A number of whom he has installed in lucrative positions in his offices. Now what do you think of that? Harrison, turning from Ticker, right. I think the staff ought to get even with the man who wrote it. Paces up and down right. I tell you what the staff ought to do. Clear out every mother's son of us. Bragdon rises. Mac! I mean it. I'll admit that's a nasty article, but it's only what we should expect. Why shouldn't people think we are bleeding him? He doesn't need us any more than a fish needs a drink. And everybody knows it. Ticker. Nopper to Ticker. Now, don't get your scotch up, Mac. Monty does need us instead of a lot of strangers who would only think of his money and what they could get of it. We must all keep on trying to hold him back. Looks at Harrison. That would be all very well. Only it don't do a damn bit of good. Ticker stops. Second boy enters up left center. Telegram to first boy at desk and exits right second. He'll be broke before the year is out. Then who'll want to engage any of us? No one will ever have any confidence in us or respect for us. Boy enters right from door right second. You want it on the phone, Mr. Bragdon. Bragdon exits up right second. What is it? Harrison, center, reads telegram. Stick to your knitting and don't ask questions, Jones. Another of those things from the King of Mysteries. Monty sends him a telegram about once an hour. First boy enters right second, crosses to desk, sits. Harrison, crossing right center, places telegram on Monty's desk in front of typewriter. I'd like to find out who he is. I asked Monty the other day. Harrison, right center, turns. What did he say? He said, Jones is like war. He's hell. Harrison crosses to Ticker. Second boy enters right second, crosses to Mac, left center, gives Mac paper. Listed account of ball expenditures to date, sir. Exits right. Mac to Harrison, looking at list. The expenses of this ball will make Monty's grandfather 
turn over in his grave bragdon enters hurriedly with hat and coat to first boy get mr brewster's house on the phone first boy business with phone what's up the tenderloin bank is up ticker stops what high as a kite closed its doors just heard over the phone phew Harrison clutches tape and breaks it, holds piece in each hand. Bragdon to Harrison. How much did Monty have there? Over a hundred thousand. I'm going over to the bank now. If Monty comes in, don't say anything about it until I get back. You needn't worry about Monty. I think like a paltry hundred thousand would bother him, the way he's going it now. Bragdon at door, up left centre. Well, there's no good speaking of it until I find out how bad it is. If he's at the house, though, get him down here, will you? I'll phone the house. All right. I'll go just as quickly as possible and be back in no time. Exit left centre. Over a hundred thousand dollars. It's getting worse every day. Phone rings. Harrison answers it. Hello? Who's this? Why? Oh, Rawls, is Mr. Brewster there? And you don't know where he went? Well, if he comes in, ask him to come down to the office right away. That's all. Goodbye. Puts up receiver. Enter second boy from right first. Goes to Harrison Center. Hands him paper. The statement, sir, Mr. Brewster wanted to January 1st. Exit right first. Harrison takes paper, center. I hate to look at it. Looks. You needn't look at me. Two hundred and forty thousand dollars spent in three months. Hands back the statement. This is criminal. Running his eye down the list, pointing to items on statement and showing them to Harrison. Notice what this Clayton woman is costing him. About seventy thousand dollars. It's appalling. It's one thing to take a chance on Subby's opera, but spending all this money on her is another. Begin pacing up and down. He said he was buying all that bunch of jewelry and gowns for the production. But the apartment he's rented and the turnouts he's engaged can't be for the production and now bragg says he's going to rent a house for her and furnish it on the installment plan if you can beat that it looks like the one rotten thing in all his extravagance knopper paces up and down right during this harrison sits right center i can't think he's mixed up in that sort of game knopper when he comes I'm going to tell him that one of his staff has had enough. Sits left at desk. Doorbell rings off stage, up left center. Ding, ding, ding. First boy rises, crosses to right side of door. Third boy opens door and marches on stage about ten feet with second boy. They take a step to the side and right and left face respectively. Fourth boy follows and takes position opposite first boy. Monty enters and comes down to third and second boys. Third boy takes paper and stick to second boy, hat and gloves, hands them to first boy, and takes overcoat. Overcoat, hat, and stick are placed on hall tree up center and left there. Fourth boy takes cigar from his mouth as third boy hands him his paper. Second, third, and fourth boys exit left. First boy sits at desk. Monty crosses to his chair center. Hello, boys. Hello. Hello. Monty looks from one to the other, notes their serious faces. What are you fellows laughing at? Looks at Mac, whose expression is blank. Boy. First boy crosses to him. Yes, sir. Monty takes roll of bills from his pocket, peels off a yellow one. Go up to Thorley's, get a couple of dozen orchids, put them in Mr. McLeod's room. They may cheer him up a bit. Takes up letters from desk. 
During the following scene, he is busy opening and reading his mail, tearing up some letters and throwing them into wastebasket, laying aside others for answering. Yes, sir. Starts up. And boy. First boy stops and turns. Yes, sir. Bring me a receipt. Yes, sir. And boy? Yes, sir. Go in a taxi. Yes, sir. Exit up left center. Receipts for last night's expenses, dinner, theater, and supper. Places memos in front of his desk. He has memo book left second. Takes papers in his pockets. Oh, tips and incidentals, $116.50. Writes amount on pad on desk, rips off sheet, places it with other papers. Put that on the miscellaneous account. Mac crosses, gets papers, and returns. Have you seen the trumpet? Yes, we've seen it. Second boy enters up left center and sits at desk. Monty sits, fishing Chronicle out of his pocket. They say this thing in the Chronicle is a typographical error, but I'm not so sure about it. Reads. Magnificent ball to be given to Miss Drew by her fiancé, Montgomery Brewster. If I could find out who wrote that article, I'd be willing to accept a present of $5,000. Harrison rises, crosses right and up left. Monty opens mail. There ought to be something coming to that gentleman who wrote the trumpet article. It came to him, Nopper, at 9.30 this morning. What happened? You licked him? Go and look him over. Mac rises, crosses left center. You shouldn't have done it. A man with all your money can't afford these luxuries. He'll sue you for assault and battery, sure. Monty, face lighting up. By Jove, I never thought of that. I wonder where the Chronicle Man is. Rises, takes a step up, as if to go and look for him. Bragdon dashes in, slamming door left center from up left center. Ticker. Have you heard about the Tenderloin Bank? Of course I've heard about it. I've been in it. Anything the matter with it? It has failed, that's all. Wiped out. Shakes hands. Monty looks at him quickly, radiantly. It's mighty tough, Monty. You had 130000 on deposit there. Ticker stops. Monty, shaking hands with him, all stare at him. With entire change of tone and manner, goes to desk, figuring quickly on pad. 3000 a day. 45 days. Boys, if this turns out right, we can take a vacation. Bragdon, crossing down to him, left center. It can't turn out all right. I've been over and got the facts. I tell you, the money's gone, and they say the Tenderloin is only the first to go. There's talk all over the place about the bank downstairs. Not the Manhattan Island. Yes, the Manhattan Island. You've got twice as much there as you had in the Tenderloin. I'll draw out your balance as quick as Nopper can sign a cheque, and I can get downstairs. Harrison and Bragdon start off as if to get cheque right first. Monty, realizing the possibilities of gain by another failure. Stop. Let the money stay there. What? What? I'll show you what kind of sport I am. Monty, don't joke about this. There isn't time. Of course, we're sorry for Colonel Drew, but... Monty rises quickly. That's it. Colonel Edward Drew is my friend. The father of the beautiful girl they say I'm going to marry. Do you think I'd desert him in his hour of need? Never. A thousand times never. Call Monty Brewster a fool, a dolt, a spendthrift, what you will. But it shall never be said of him that he deserted a friend in the hour of need. Sits center. Monty, you are either crazy or the biggest hearted man in the world. Max sits left. I'll give you a third guess some day. Phone bell rings. Harrison exits right first. Bragdon answers. Hello? Yes, he's here. Who is it? Stone? Oh, he's too busy to talk to you just now. Is that the real estate man? Bragdon into phone. Wait a minute. To Monty. Yes? 
Oh, I want to talk to him. Takes phone. But Monty. Monty, into phone. Hello, Stone. This is Brewster. Found a house for Miss Clayton? Oh, well... How much? No, no, I want a house, not a hen coop. What? Don't care if it's $50,000. Meg rises, crosses left center. Miss Clayton will play in New York a long time. She's going to entertain. Mac and Bragdon, who have listened in disgust, suddenly turn, dash to their respective offices, and slam the doors. Monty looks up, smiles, shakes his head, then into the phone. Well, now you're talking. No, no, only until the end of September. I've no time to look at it. Send over and get a check. Goodbye. Hangs up receiver. Takes out notebook. Bravo. Tenderloin. Credit. Bank failure 130000 That's the biggest stroke yet. He phones. Send Miss Boynton here. He picks up telegram on table. Hello, Jones. Stick to your knitting and don't ask questions. Miss Boynton enters left second. Monty has formed the letters he has opened into three separate piles upon the desk. Good morning, Mr. Brewster. I want to thank you for your beautiful treat last evening. Sits left centre, has stenographer's notebook and pencil. Was it my treat last night? What did I do? Have you forgotten sending me the tickets for the show and the flowers and candy? Monty taking out notebook. 1450, I wonder. Right. What did I do with those receipts? Looks through pockets, dictating. Telegram Jones, Boot, Montana. Don't ask questions. Who else can I ask questions of? You say you hate a stingy man. Don't be stingy with advice. No, make it with your advice. Extra word. I've chartered a yacht for a cruise around the world. We'll wire you itinerary of trip. No, we can lengthen that a bit. Thanks for a moment. Say, I myself will send you the various addresses where I may or shall be found just as soon as it is possible for me to discover the various addresses where I shall be found. Banks are failing all around me. I am leading at the quarter by 100,000, but I have got some running to do yet. Postscript. How do you pronounce your Christian name? Reply collect. Enter Max suddenly from his office right second. He has three months statement and the ball expense list and his written resignation to Monty and slams them down in front of him on the desk one at a time as he says the following. There is the statement to January 1st, showing that nearly one-third of your fortune is wiped out. Slam. There's the expense list of the ball to date. Slam. And there's my resignation. He knocks the typewriter from the desk. Monty starts at the last, looks quickly to Mac, then quietly. Gently, sunshine. You'll hurt your hand. To boy. Boy, take that typewriter out and have it fixed. Second boy is reading novel at desk up left center, rises confused, and starts across to take Miss Boynton out. As he gets to her right, Monty attracts his attention and indicates the machine on the floor left center. He gets up and goes to the door. Where shall I take it? Tiffany's. Movement of disgust from Mac. Monty dictates to Miss Boynton. Telegram. Sunshine McLeod, Esquire, Manhattan Island, Building City. My dear Sunshine. To Mac. They nabbed me this morning, Sunshine. To Miss Boynton. Replying to your favor, just received, tendering your resignation to take place on the first of the month. To Mac. Yes, sir. Van and I wanted to see the new car move a bit, and they pinched us. Mac, interested in the dictation. Why did you let them catch you? I thought of the fine. What? Monty assumed dignity. I don't want to evade the law. If I ought to be fined, I want to be fined and get a receipt. Movement of disgust from Mac. Where were we? Miss Boynton, looking at dictation book. The first of the month. I have noted carefully your reasons for wishing to retire. To wit. Referring to Mac's letter. Crazy, irrepressible, unresponsible, irresponsible, 
idiotical, impossible, etc., etc. And so you are. If, however, you will delay your retirement, I shall appreciate it greatly. I therefore beg that you retain your position until the end of September. Not jump the traces now and show your long ears. Always your friend. Mac jumps up from chair, crosses right second. You've shown your long ears already. Exits into his office, slamming door right second. Monty quietly picking up letter, dictating. Telegram. Enoch Hood, Esquire. E-N-O-C-H. Make it N-O-C-K. 16 Queen Street, Long Island City. Borough of Queens. Telephone number 2020 Maine. Also offices in Peoria, Kansas City, and Chicago. Cable address Spelden. Dear Sir, I note that you have an invention which will make me a fortune. I would suggest that you invent something that will make a fortune for yourself. One fortune is all I care to handle at present. Yours truly. Nopper Harrison enters, crosses to Ticker. Hello, Nopper. What are you hugging that Ticker for? <laughs> the stocks aren't going to suit me. Ticker stops. Have you looked up lumber and fuel? Harrison, excitedly, a step down right center. It's the last stock on earth you want to buy, Monty. Lumber is ten points too high. Think of the situation. All the lumbermen overstocked and a building strike threatened. There must be a slump. Think so? I'm sure of it. Crosses back to Ticker. Thanks. Into phone. Get Allison and company. Harrison goes to Ticker, watches quotation, which is being ticked off. His face suddenly shows despair. Wiped out. Exit right first. Ticker stops. Monty rises, hands two piles of letter to Miss Boynton. Miss Boynton rises also. Say no thank you to these, and yes please to these. Yes, sir. Goes up right second. Send them by Western Union. Miss Boynton stops and turns. Excuse me, Mr. Brewster. I'm only a poor girl, but I've got some pride, and I'd like to know why you send all my letters by telegraph. Phone. They're clearer that way. In phone. Hello, Allison. What? Oh, well, tell Mr. Allison Mr. Brewster wants to speak to him, will you please? Thank you. Miss Boynton, half crying. I ain't appreciated here. My work was never criticised before, and I could have married the last man I worked for. Yes, what was the matter with him? I beg your pardon. Telephone Tyson like a good girl, and get a box for the 14th Street Theatre tonight. Miss Boynton, all smiles. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Brewster. Going, stops at door, turns. The 14th Street, did you say? Yes, Chauncey Olcott's there. You'll like that. Miss Boynton exits. Monty, into phone. Hello, is that you, Allison? Yes, this is Brewster. Yes, how are you? Say, I want to buy 10,000 shares of lumber and fuel. No 10-point margin. Yes, send over and get a check. I know, everybody says it's a bad time to buy. That's the reason I want it. Smiles. I don't know anything about the races. Got a tip? Nay, Bob. First race? Cinch, eh? Just a minute. Picks up Chronicle from desk and looks at entries. How about Polite? Same race. Outclassed? No chance at all? Well, can you get me a thousand on him? No, straight to win. What? All right, when Nabob wins. I'll apologize. Goodbye. Van enters up left center, stands by door. Do you allow ladies in here, chief? Monty rises, crosses to him to shake hands. Hello, Van. What are you doing down here? I work here. Of course you do. Who's with you? Old chap Armstrong. Look here, my boy. You'd better give her up. Perhaps you'll explain how I can give up something I haven't got. She doesn't care anything for you. 
you interfere with her platonic ideas. Now you give your Uncle Dudley a little time. I'll show you what her platonic ideas are worth. All right, but don't keep her waiting out there all day. Starts upstage. Barbara Drew is with us. Monty stops. Miss Drew? Has she seen her father? Not since she's been with us. Why? Some trouble downstairs in the bank. Shh. Monty rises and goes quickly up. Second boy opens door left center. Barbara and Janice Armstrong enter. Boy exits same door. Barbara shakes hands with Monty center and crosses right. How do you do? Delightfully surprised. Miss Armstrong following Barbara. How do you do, Mr. Brewster? Getting gray, working overtime. I hope we're not intruding. We only peeped in for a moment. No, indeed. Won't you sit down? Indicates chair right of his desk. Miss Armstrong? He places chair left center. Don't worry about me, dear fellow. I believe in a woman's taking care of herself. I've devoted two chapters to that in my book. By the way, we shall have the proofs of that book in tomorrow. Oh, really? Your book, Janice? Yes, my book. The book which I hope will eventually bury the hatchet between the sexes. It's going to be great. You should see the design I've had done for the cover. What about the story? It isn't a story. It's a book on the flaming question of Platonism and its friendly message to mankind. They go up left. Barbara sits right center. I have just had a struggle with my pride. Monty sits on corner of desk, down right center. Indeed. Why? After the way you have persistently kept away from us, it needed courage to seek you out. You're joking. I assure you I am not. Papa and I have made every effort to induce you to dine with us, and we should have been flattered had you condescended to drop in for tea. Well, I've been so frightfully busy. I haven't been anywhere. I didn't think you would ever want to see me again. Why, pray? Monty picks up the trumpet. Have you seen the trumpet? Barbara, looking down modestly and speaking coyly. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's why. It has worried me, I can tell you. Barbara, glancing at him questioningly. I'm sorry. I'm dreadfully cut up about it. It's too bad that you are so annoyed. Monty, not noticing tone. To have you humiliated this way through me. And don't think about it any more, please, Mr. Brewster. I don't feel a bit humiliated. <laughs> An awful funny thing happened in connection with the story. Really? What was it? Barbara looks at him roguishly, smiles, and turns away. Ah, uh, I daren't tell you. Do, please. It's too absurd. You must tell me. Papa read it and... Yes? He thought it was true. <laughs> he thinks we're engaged. <laughs> <laughs> I should think it was absurd. <clears throat> well, I bet that chap won't write about us again in a hurry. Coupling our names. Ridiculous. Crosses right to ticker. Barbara, rising, crosses left. Mustn't we be going, Janice? Van, suddenly remembering, up left. By Jove, so we must. Starts for door. What's your hurry, Van? Now this is my party, Monty, and you can't run it. We have a most important appointment at Mallard's. Office boy opens door up right center. Mrs. Dan enters. Well, I seem to have dropped in on a reception day. Gives Monty her hand, nods to others. Hello, Mrs. Dan. Welcome. What in the world are you doing downtown? Wonderful to relate. Dan brought me down. He has some business in the bank downstairs. Monty and Van exchange rapid glances. Archie, are you initiating the girls into the mysteries of Monty's business? I don't understand it well enough for that myself. We've only been looking over the plant. 
It is most comfortable to labor in, isn't it? Mrs. Dan, as Van, Miss Armstrong, and Barbara go to door up left center. I hope I'm not driving you away. No, we were just leaving. So much business going on here, we're dazed. Come on, ladies, we'll leave these schemers to talk over the ball. He opens door. Janice and Barbara pass out, then Van, exchanging goodbyes with Monty and Mrs. Dan. Oh, Van, get the car down to the side entrance, will you? Excuse me, Mrs. Dan. Exits, up left center, talking to Van, ad lib. Mrs. Dan picks up trumpet from desk. Bragdon enters right first. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Dan? What look? I've just come from Peggy's. I told her that we all felt that he would listen to her and how anxious you boys were to have her talk to him and try to make him understand how his behavior is being criticized. Has she consented to come? Peggy's a dear. You can think how she dreads it, but she's coming this afternoon. Splendid. Bully for Peggy. Enter Monty, left center. Oh, Bragg. Excuse me, Mrs. Dan. Certainly. Reads. Bragdon crosses to Monty. I want you to go downstairs to the bank and ask Colonel Drew if there is anything I can do for him. Now, Monty. Bragg, please. Oh, all right. Crosses to door left center. Good afternoon, Mrs. Dan. Exits left center. Good afternoon. Monty offers her his chair. Monty, what brought Barbara Drew down here? Monty goes to Mrs. Dan. Van had the girls out driving, and they just dropped in for a moment. She chose rather a peculiar time, don't you think? Why? Mrs. Dan holds up trumpet, then lays it on desk as she sits. I saw the trumpet today. Oh. Monty, I don't want you to be foolish. What are you driving at, Mrs. Dan? That article made me boil. I thought, but... Miss Drew was very sweet about it. Sits left center. Of course she was. She doesn't even deny it. She's evidently quite pleased. Monty up and crosses up left center. Oh, you must be mistaken, Mrs. Dan. Anyhow, I don't think of it as far as I am concerned. There's only one girl for me, and she's not Barbara Drew. Say, Mrs. Dan, why does she refuse to see me? Is it on account of these stories about Miss Drew? Why does who refuse to see you? Why, Peggy, of course. Who else? Won't she see you? No, I've called repeatedly and she's never at home. Peggy wouldn't refuse to see you on account of any stories. She wouldn't, would she? Yes, but she does refuse. Do you want to see her very much? Very much. More than anything in the world. Then you'll be glad to hear that she is going to call on you this afternoon. Monty comes to her center. Really? Honestly? How do you know? She told me so. Peggy is worried about what the gossips are saying. Everyone's talking about the way you're squandering your money and the expense of the ball. We'll work hard to make it a success, but when it's over, you must stop. Peggy coming this afternoon. That's good news. And we won't let the gossips bother her much longer. That's the beauty of my new scheme. Mrs. Dan and Ticker right turns. New scheme? What is it now? I'm tired of what everybody is saying, so we will all get away from it. What do you mean? Mrs. Dan, I've chartered a yacht for a cruise around the world, and I'm going to take all of our friends. Why, Monty Brewster, it's perfectly... Great, isn't it? I thought you'd like it. I've chartered the flitter. Ever hear of her? She burns more coal than any yacht in the world. But Monty, think. Such a cruise may cost you your entire fortune. Do you think so? By Jove, I'd like to talk to you, Mrs. Dan. I know what a yacht can cost, and you wouldn't have thought of a better plan if, if you want to spend all your money. Honestly, I love to talk to you, Mrs. Dan. You never mind the expense. I'll attend to that. What I would like to have you do, if you will, is to invite the guests and induce Peggy to go. 
You know, Mrs. Dan, I... I wouldn't go without Peggy. Now you will do this for me, won't you? You know you can always make people do whatever you want them to. A cruise around the world? Yes, just think of us all in London, Paris, Naples, the Riviera, the Mediterranean. Moonlight, starlight, silver seas sailing away with those we love, where the gossips can't reach us. The whole world will be ours. That's it. The world will be yours. You don't think you're Monty Brewster, but Monte Cristo. No, I don't. Mrs. Dan, carried away by the thought, It's glorious, Monty. The thought is positively enchanting. I, I love it, but... Monty, left center, turns. Mrs. Dan, I've crossed but out of my dictionary. I have to in my business. Mrs. Dan, looking oddly at him. Just what is your business, Monty? Frenzied finance. Cross has left for cigarette from Mac's desk and lights it. Subway Smith bursts in the door, up left center, rushes down center. Monty, you're a nice sort of... Oh, oh I beg pardon. Sees Mrs. Dan, goes right center. Why, hello, Subby. How do you do, Mrs. Dan? You're looking bully. Shakes hands. Mrs. Dan sits right center. I must be reflecting some of the enthusiasm of this young spendthrift. How did the show go, Subby? Haven't you seen the Philadelphia papers? Not yet. Was your opera produced last night? I knew nothing about it. It isn't strange that you didn't know about it, but we thought our angel might have remembered us. It nearly broke Miss Clayton's heart not to have you there, Maudie. I sent her a telegram and everything Thorley had in stock. Tell us, really, how did it go? Miss Clayton was great. You've made her, Monty. Monty, smoking, seated left. Yes, that's all right. How was the show? Guardy thought it was too slow. That's good. But I tell you, with a little fixing up, I could make it the biggest hit. Monty rises, crossing center decidedly. I'll attend to the fixing up. Heaven, Subby, whoever thought you could write an opera? Well, I like that. Phone bell rings. I'm so glad, Subby. My heartiest congratulations. Excuse me. Into phone. Yes, yes. Oh, is this you, Allison? Got it, eh? One hundred and eight and three quarter. Ten thousand? That was right. Goodbye. Ten thousand what? A little flyer in lumber and fuel, Sub. Lumber and fuel? You must have thought the show was a frost. Who gave you the tip? It's a tip I shouldn't advise you to follow, Mrs. Dan. Subby, going to ticker. One oh eight and three quarters. Eight and a half. Eight and a quarter. No, Mrs. Dan, don't you follow it. It's eight now. Better sell, Monty. Monty shows satisfaction as Subby calls off quotations. Perhaps I'm a hoodoo. I'll go. She rises. I hope it will go up, Monty. Monty rising. Don't say that, Mrs. Dan. Well, whichever way you want it to go, I never know. Dan loses when they go up and loses again when they come down and then says I'm dull because I can't understand. Yes. You are certainly becoming a gambler, Monty. You'll be playing the races next. Come to think of it, I did today. Really, that's a game I know something about. Which horse did you bet on? Monty tries to remember them. Excuse me. Crosses and gets paper. That horse there, polite. Polite, hey? That's a fine horse to play. Do you know what polite would do if he were leading in the stretch? After you, my dear Alphonse. Polite indeed. Bows and crosses to Ticker. First boy enters up left center with large box of flowers from Thorley's. Crosses right. Did you say these flowers were for Mr. McLeod, Mr. Brewster? Flowers? Yes, Mr. McLeod's room. Boy exits right second. Is it Mac's birthday? Just trying to cheer him up a bit. Mac off stage. Take those flowers out of here. Kicks boy off and throws box lid and orchids after him. Boy scrambling and picking up flowers. Mr. McLeod doesn't want these orchids, sir. Doesn't he like orchids? 
Mac's afraid of becoming popular. Don't mind him. Put them in Mr. Bragdon's office. Boy, exits right first. If he's in that frame of mind, I'll go before he comes in. At door, Monty crosses to her, shakes hands. Until tonight, then. We can talk over the ball at the opera. Let me go with you, Mrs. Dan. Well, come along. I'll take you a few blocks. Be careful of Mr. McLeod, Monty. Goodbye. Oh, Max, all right. Thank you for dropping in. I'll be back soon, Monty. Mrs. Dan and Subby exit left upper entrance. All right, Sub, see you later. Mac enters from financial secretary's office. Mac, crossing to Monty, center. I have just received your telegram in reply to my resignation. Puts telegram before Monty. Monty takes telegram. Now, Mac, don't quit me before September. I know you fellows think I'm crazy, but I'm not. Just give me a chance. Oh, I'll stay until September if we're not all in the gutter by then. But why do you refuse to withdraw your balance in the Manhattan? Bragg says they will never last the day out. Is that so? Yes, it's so. Mac, just a minute. Writing check. I wish you would go over to the Fifth National Bank and get this check cashed and bring me the money here. Hurry, like a good fellow. Mac, as they go up right center. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? What do you want all that cash for? Monty puts his hat on Mac and pushes him off right third, then returns to desk, jubilant. Car fare. Enter Harrison, stands looking at Monty a moment, drops hat and coat on chair and desk, right center, and crosses determinedly. Where are you off to, Nopper? I've got all my papers fixed up in the air. Mac can take charge of them. Monty, figuring. What's the matter? Monty, I've got to quit. You behave yourself. Monty, you... Looking at Monty squarely for the first time and almost wildly. What's the matter, old man? Rises, looks at him. Why, you are white as a ghost. Puts his hands on Harrison's shoulders. The truth is, I've... I've taken some of your money, Monty. And I've lost it. Monty looks quickly at him, then delightedly. Have you? I did it with the idea of helping you out. Of course it was crazy and criminal, but you've been losing so rapidly, and I thought I saw an easy chance to make a hundred thousand for you. But there was a slump, and I'm wiped out. That's all right. Monty, you're too decent. Monty, taking a count book from his pocket. How much was it? Thirty-five thousand dollars. Monty crosses to desk quickly. $35,000. Enters amount in book. It's horrible on top of this bank business. I ought never to have come here. Why, I haven't slept for weeks thinking of the pace you're going. It's been driving me mad. It's been hell, Monty, for us all, Mac, Bragg, and myself to be the business end of your rank mad extravagance, to see the best fellow on earth go into his ruin against every word of our advice, to know that everywhere people are sneering at us behind our backs, calling us grafters, hangers-on, parasites, and now, oh God, to realize that I'm a thief. Sits, head buried in arms, on desk, Nopper. Monty springs up and goes to Nopper's side, right center. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. When I asked you fellows to come with me, I didn't realize that what I wanted you to do would react on you and make you suffer. I looked on this as a long holiday with business thrown in. And now I see how awful it must have been for you, and I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But I've got to go on. Why? Why have you got to go on? Nopper, old man, I'd give anything in the world if I could tell you. But I can't. You mustn't blame yourself for what I've done, Monty. That was my fault entirely. 
and I'm going to work and square it with you, unless you decide to have me arrested. Nopper, don't talk like that. We've been pals all our lives. I understand why you bought the stock, and you were doing me a big favor. Harrison starts to go. Nopper, you're not going to leave me. Don't ask me to stay. I couldn't after what I've done. Can't you understand? What are you going to do? Go west. I may hit on something in the mining country. I know that game a little. I'll grub stake you, Nopper. No, Monty, your money has caused me suffering enough. I'd rather die than handle another penny of it. Don't think I'm ungrateful. I appreciate the way you're treating me. I understand. Goodbye. Monty crosses and takes his hand. Harrison presses his hand, looks at him, then quickly exits up left center. Phone rings twice. Monty watches Harrison off, turns, sighs, crosses down right center, into phone. Hello? Uh, hello? Hello? Who? Oh, hello, Guardy. Sits center. Why, yes, of course. I want to talk to you. How are you, boy? How'd the show go? Slow? That's good. What? You think it's a hit. I thought you said it was slow. Oh, of course you're in Philadelphia. And buying seats last? Oh, fast. Well, here, you close up. Never mind about that. You close up. I'll hire a theater and bring the show to New York. Trixie wants to run in Philadelphia? You tell Trixie she'd be arrested. Peggy enters up left center quietly and comes to Monty, starts to put her hands over his eyes. What she hears stops her. Well, say we can't prolong it. Oh, tell Trixie I have a house for her here in New York. Say I want her near me, any old thing. Peggy utters a slight exclamation and draws away to left. This attracts Monty's attention. He turns and sees her. At last. Hangs up phone and jumps up to her quickly. How dare you keep away from me all this time? Peggy, left center, struggling with her tears. I hope I'm not interrupting you. Of course you're not. Why? I was afraid I heard, that is, that you were busy. The boy asked me to come right in, but... Yes, I told him I expected you. You come here and sit down. He leads her to chair left, then gets the one from left center and sits to her right. I've got all sorts of things to tell you. You know I always did have to tell you everything. Yes, you used to. Monty, looking up from telegram, sitting. Why, what's the matter, Peggy? I don't know. Nothing, I hope. Anything gone wrong? Not that I know of. Things have gone wrong with me today. Peggy, who is hardly able to keep from crying. What things? Can't tell you. That's not telling me everything. Don't ask me. Why do you look like that, Peggy? Peggy, with a little shudder. Uh, I think it's because you have changed so. Oh, don't say that, Peggy. Don't you be like the rest. I have business cares now that I never dreamed of before. I began... Well, before the night of the housewarming. Do you call spending money business? No, that's too good a name for it. It's hard labor. Think of this beastly ball I'm giving. Two weeks of miserable grind, arranging the expenses. And I'd rather be caught at Hoyler's drinking ice cream soda than giving it. Peggy looks at him searchingly. Then why do you do it? Monty, it's very hard for me to speak of this but I've made up my mind to come down here and beg you to give up this extravagance. You have meant so much to Mother and to me, and we want you to be big and grow and amount to something in the world. But those things you are doing seem so silly and unlike you. People are beginning to make fun of you, Monty, and your friends are worried, and the papers. Peggy, please. I don't want to hurt you, but for your own sake, for the sake of us who are fond of you. If you don't care for the things you are doing, please be our old Monty again. Try to think. 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 Rises, crosses to center, then back to Peggy. 
Thinking has become my specialty. I think for 18 hours a day. It's all very well for the ordinary businessman to think. He thinks of something to do, does it, and that ends it. But I have to think of what other people will think, and think what they think I think, and think what they think I think I think, and I could go on. But I can stand it all if you only believe in me, Peggy. I'm trying to do the best I can under the circumstances. Only they are curious circumstances. You won't desert me, Peggy, will you? No, I shall never desert you, Monty. Peggy, you're an angel. He sits again. Now listen. I want you to do me a great big favor, will you? Peggy nods assent. Get Mother to agree to this. You see, well, I want to buy the little house for her. So I'll make a deposit in the bank to your credit. You still have your account. Third boy enters right first with office checkbook and fountain pen, crosses center downstairs. With Colonel Drew, haven't you? Yes. All right. Now I'll send a check down to the Colonel. Will you sign this check for Miss Clayton's house, Mr. Brewster? Peggy rises instantly. Take it to Mr. Harrison. He's gone, sir. Gone. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Rises, crosses to center, signs check. Boy crosses right first and exits. Monty turns to Peggy. You see, Peggy, I've got all this money. Monty, don't. Why? What's the matter? We can't take your money, Monty. Now, Peggy. Don't worry about us. We are not objects of charity. Why, ain't you ashamed? Don't try to explain. I think your money has spoiled you, Monty. She suddenly bursts into tears and flies from the room. Exits up left center. Well, Peggy. The door slams. He pauses, crosses down center, looks front. Oh, Mr. Jones, just two minutes with you. Just a pair of minutes. Bragdon enters right first. Monty, I'm going to beg you just once more to get your money out of Manhattan if you can. Monty crosses to him. Oh, I wish you fellows would mind your own business and not be so damned inquisitive. Why will you insist upon worrying if I don't? I know what I'm doing. What you fellows need is a little faith. What you need is a nurse. I tell you, they can't hold out until three o'clock. That's all right. Take it easy. Phone bell rings. Monty stops, crosses to phone, right center. In phone. Well, yes, Colonel Drew. Yes, tell him to come up. Monty, if you've arranged things downstairs, why couldn't you have told us? Subby, dashing in. Say, Monty, where did you get that lumber and fuel tip, Monty? Rushes to ticker. My hat's off. What's the matter with it? You haven't bought lumber and fuel. Subby crosses down to Bragdon. He's got 10,000 shares at 108 and three quarters. It went down a point at first, but look at the jump it's taken. Bragdon joins Subby at ticker. Subby looks a long tape. Nine and one half, nine and three quarters, ten... Monty, left, crosses to Ticker. Here, Subby, you... Goes to Ticker. Keep your jokes for your comic opera, Sub. Do you want me to have a fit? Ten and one quarter. Monty, you're a wonder. Monty, looking at tape. Great Christopher! Dashes to phone. Ten and one half? Heavens, say it go up. Monty, into phone, yelling. Get Allison and company, quick! Enter Colonel Drew in intense excitement, white-faced and trembling, goes quickly to Monty, noticing others, speaks to Monty in low voice, grasping his hand and shaking it, Monty too anxious for the phone bell to comprehend immediately. My boy, how can I thank you? Did you buy some too? Bragdon has told me how you refused to draw out your balance. Monty distractedly. Oh, that's all right. Noticing Colonel's terrible excitement and white face with sudden awe of pity. Drew looks toward Subby and Bragdon at Ticker. Eleven! Monty turns back upon Colonel, who is about to speak, and grabs phone again. Colonel, too intent upon the bank to think of anything else, walks excitedly up stage and down again. Monty speaks into phone. Where's Allison and company? I don't care if they are busy. You get Allison and company and get them quick. 
Seeing Colonel again, Excuse me, Colonel, little business. Can I be of any further help? Colonel clutches Monty by the arms. Brewster, listen. I must pull this thing through. It would kill me to have that bank close. It shan't close. I came to ask. Phone bell. Monty, who has been listening attentively, springs to phone. Hello, Allison. What? Oh, blazes, it's for you, Colonel. Colonel takes phone, stands in front of Monty's desk center. Twelve! Monty, twelve! Monty jumps to ticker, then back, makes movement as if to take phone away from Colonel. Hello? Who? Slight pause, then he looks front with agonized expression, sinks into chair. My God! Monty, taking phone from him and hanging up receivers. What is it, Colonel? Colonel rises. Oglethorpe wants to draw out $250,000. Well, let him have it. That's just what I was going to deposit. My boy! Tries to seize Monty's hand as phone bell rings. Monty jumps to phone. The colonel clutches the air. Monty in phone. What, busy? You offer Central a thousand dollars to get me Allison. Boy enters up right third with telegram, comes down right center. Here's a telegram for you, sir. Go over to Allison and company and tell them to call me up. Rushes him off right third. Enter Mac. Here's your $250,000. I hope it'll last you through the afternoon. Monty takes money. I hope not. Crosses to Colonel, down left center. Hands Colonel money. Here you are, Colonel. Max stays up center by desk. Bragdon comes forward a step, right center. Stop, Monty. Colonel Drew. If you allow Monty to deposit that money with your bank on the point of closing its doors, I say it's no better than stealing. Stop that, Bragg. But, Monty, the bank is tottering. I don't believe it's tottering. It's only tittering. Crosses to Colonel gives him money. The bank is as solid as a rock if we can only gain time. This deposit will save the bank and save the 260000 you now have with us. Starts to go up left center, Monty taking money back. Save it? Well, wait a minute. On second thoughts, Colonel. Brewster, I'm telling you the truth. You'll not only save your own money, but the money of hundreds of poor depositors. Think, my boy, think. Monty, suddenly realizing that Peggy's money is in the bank. Peggy! To Colonel. Here you are, Colonel. Bragg and Mac. Give up the fight now. Monty hands him money. God bless you. Exits up left center. Twelve and one quarter. Monty grabbing phone again. Is anybody going to get me Allison and company? Twelve and one half. Allison and company? Say, what the hell has struck lumber and fuel? I know it's going up. Has it a chance to go down? Twelve and three quarters. You sell and sell quick. Enter Vanderpool, up left. Vanderpool comes down quickly. Say, Monty, I fixed it with the judge. You won't have to pay that fine for speeding. I wish you'd attend to your own business. I don't want any judge squared. Great smoke! Monty, what do you think? Polite wins at forty to one. Runs down center with piece of ticker tape. What? Jumps to him and grabs tape. And he had a thousand on him straight. Business, congratulations. Curtain. Monty reads tape and collapses. The boy's shaking his hands and slapping him on the back by way of congratulations. He is dazed. Second picture, same. Third, all boys except Nopper and Monty. Fourth call, Peggy and Monty. End of Act. Two. Act Three of Brewster's Millions by Winchell Smith and Byron Ongley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. Scene represents deck on yacht. 
Orchestra on stage playing Give My Regards to Broadway. Piano after Rise. Music on stage. At Rise, Moonlight. Vanderpool sitting right center. Miss Armstrong stands center. Mixing cocktail. Tray on cabin roof left with ingredients. Owner ashore lantern. Seven bells. Vanderpool on chair right. You're awfully kind, old chap. It's great to have a pal like you. Miss Armstrong at cabin roof, dashing shaker. Think so? Yes, indeed. She turns drink into glass and offers it to him. He takes it, rises. Thank you. Where's yours? You know perfectly well that I don't drink. I hoped you would this time. I'm going to drink to home. Are you getting sentimental about your country? Sentimental? After all your teaching? I should think not. Only that tune. Give my regards to Broadway. Miss Armstrong looks away. Guess I'm homesick, old chap. She looks quickly at him. Platonically? I have a great big friendly feeling just now for the USA, and I'm going to drink to it with a good old American cocktail. Here's to New York, the best town in the best country in the world. Offering glass. Now, won't you? Miss Armstrong touches the glass with her lips. E pluribus unum. Front. Drinks. She looks and shakes her head. You mustn't get homesick too often. Cocktails aren't good for you. After dinner, too. Takes glass over and puts it down right center on cabin roof. They are good any time when you make them. Goes to her center. Somehow, old chap. Everything you do seems all right to me. I never had a pal I like so before. Now, Van, remember, none of that. You know I don't approve of anything sentimental. Turns away. You are always saying that we should be honest with each other. We should be honest. That is one of the delights of the platonic belief. Vanderpool goes to her. Well, there's something particular I want to be honest about with you, Janice. Miss Armstrong turns to him. Well, what is it? Beautiful evening, isn't it? Was that what you wanted to be honest about? No, I... Then what was it? Are you afraid to tell me? No, I... Well then, out with it. I'm in love, that's all. Van. Awful, isn't it? It is indeed. I'm disappointed in you, Van. Starts away left. Ah, please don't go. Crosses to her, she stops. You see, I need your advice. Perhaps you can help me to fight down this miserable, weak feeling. Miss Armstrong turns. My advice will be of very little use in a love affair. But you know the girl so well. You see, I want to find out if she cares for me. If I can ask her to... I don't want to hear any more. I've always known that the two worst things in the world for Platonism are cocktails and moonlight. Good night. Starts away left. Vanderpool holding her. Just one question, Janice. If you'll answer me honestly, I won't say another word about it. You promise? I promise. Miss Armstrong, right center, looks at him steadily. Well, go on. Do you think, honestly now... That Barbara Drew cares anything about me? Miss Armstrong turns in front quickly with sudden emotion which she cannot conceal. Why, 
I... Vanderpool takes her face in his hands suddenly and kisses her. You've answered my question, thanks. Miss Armstrong, horrified. Oh! I have thought you loved me for some time. Now I know it. I don't. I... Vanderpool turns. Yes, you do. Crosses back to her center. Let's be honest now. I don't care about any other girl but you. But your platonic nonsense isn't going to come between us any longer. After we are married and have had a good long honeymoon, you can begin your Platonism again if you want to. How dared you kiss me? How dare you talk to me about marriage? You have behaved like a beast. You couldn't go on like that if you didn't love me. Love you indeed. I hate you. I hate you. You mean that? Yes, I mean that. All right, then. Goodbye. Bum melodramatic manner. He suddenly rips off coat and leaps to the rail up left center. Miss Armstrong runs up and holds him, screams. What are you doing? Don't jump! She holds him desperately. Vanderpool on rail up left center. Let me go. You don't care for me. Struggles to get away. Don't, Van, don't. Please, don't. Perhaps I do care. Ah. Leaves rail. She throws her arms around him and kisses him. Vanderpool gets down quickly and takes her in his arms. My darling. Mac and Bragdon enter quickly, left second. What the deuce is the matter? I nearly went overboard and Miss Armstrong saved my life. Miss Armstrong stands rigid a moment, then dashes off, left second. You're a nice chap. Why aren't you in the cabin for the meeting? Vanderpool, putting on his coat, left center. I had something much more important on hand. What did you decide upon? I've drawn up a petition asking Monty to sail for home. Everyone is to sign it. You must present it to Monty before us all. I don't want to present your old petition. I'd like to have the cruise last the rest of my life. Steward enters left second, switches on deck lights and exits left second. Foots go up one quarter white. And you're the only one. The rest of us want to get home. Get anywhere to stop Monty spending any more money on us. He certainly has entertained us up to the limit. He's entertained us to death. And we're all sick of it. Why, even the sailors are kicking. They are tired of being fed on birds and champagne. And they want some salt pork and beer. Bragdon, taking paper from pocket. You ought to see this statement, Van. It's awful. Less than a year since he was left his fortune, and it's half gone. Think of his blowing in half a million in ten months. And it's only by fool luck he has half of it left. If he hadn't broken the bank at Monte Carlo. I tried to congratulate him that night, but he wouldn't have it at all. What do you think he said? What? Take warning by me, Bragg, and never gamble. There's only one answer to all this, boys. What is it? He's dippy, and you'll all find it out some day. Anyhow, the first thing to do is to get him home. What do you suppose we've been anchored here five days for? Noise of launch. That's what I would like to know. Captain has tried to get away from this coast. Says it would be dangerous if we were to catch a blow. But Monty won't listen. And he hangs around the cable office in town all day long. He's got some scheme on hand, sure, that he won't tell us about. Well, if he has some secret reasons for staying here, what's the good of our petition? 
if we make it strong enough he'll either have to tell us or agree to take us home bragdon going up and looking off left here's his launch you get the petition van bring the people up here and we'll have it over with comes down centre all right just as you say only i don't feel like wasting time with petitions and rows just now rises crosses and exits left second bell one two one stop launch mac going up why it's not monty it's a stranger hang me if it isn't the frenchman monty was with in monte carlo the chap he said was his agent yes by jove he's the reason we've been sticking here now we'll try to find out what's up Shh. enter up left monsieur barge comes down center ah gentlemen's will you pardon but is it not that i may see mr brewster at once he's ashore at present ashore oh that is too bad i must tell him new important very important i order the boat who brings me here to return to the land perhaps i can call him back starts up stage mac goes after him and quickly stopping barge no don't do that mr brewster will be here soon now are you sure of this there is no time to lose if he doesn't come we'll get you ashore ah to you i am much oblige that's all right bragdon cross to barge you are the gentleman mr brewster sent away on business ah you know about him eh why you remember we met you in monte carlo in monte carlo we oui. when mr brewster spoke to you about about what yes he spoke to you about about the plan you know we oui, about the plan but he tell me it was a secret a secret oh yes of course he doesn't want his guests to know about it barge looks perplexed mac whispering in his ear oh no he wouldn't want them to know about it would he well he tell me it was secret business that's it secret business what's the good of a secret if everybody knows about it i or we we ourselves wouldn't have known about it if it wasn't that he indicating bragdon is mr brewster's private secretary yes i'm his private secretary and you know a man always tells his private secretary everything ah then i can tell you everything with great pride barge looks left and right boys do same i have seen the mayor at alberiz and he has consent mac after a glance at bragdon boys both laugh mirthlessly oh the, the mayor has consented has he barge to mac but should mr brewster fail to arrive in alberiz in two days he's all off it's all off barge to bragdon we oui, he's too late city starts to light slowly too late for what don't you understand no i'm hanged if i do de birthday of the saint come on the sixteenth de month and to make a public holiday the mayor must make announcement by de tenth or it cannot be bragdon to mac either he's crazy or monty is they are both crazy barge to mac ha 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 the mayor he tell me i am crazy too well you can't blame him for that but at last he say if mr brewster give to him by the tenth the two million francs he will make the holiday and the carnival can take place bragdon to mac two million francs that's about all he's got left i am going to straighten this out or die now you see here sir 
Mr. Brewster sent you to the mayor of Alberici, didn't he? That was after I tell him of the saint, you know. Uh, yes, I know. But why did you tell him of the saint? It was this way. Monsieur Brewster say to me he would like to give a grand celebration to surprise his friends. I tell him of a saint that is buried in Alberiz that do not have his birthday celebrate these one hundred years, the Saint Brustoro. He say, Brustoro? Ah, he is my ancestor. He told you the saint was his ancestor. Oui, monsieur. Then he say, I celebrate his birthday, and I pay for everything. Now the birthday is come the sixteenth this month, so Mr. Brewster, he sent me quick to Alberiz to tell the mayor if he will make that day a public holiday, he will pay two million francs to give great carnival in honor of his ancestor. He must be damned fond of his ancestor. So you see, is important I inform Mr. Brewster at once, because after two days is too late. Then if Mr. Brewster doesn't get to Alberiz in two days, this carnival can't take place? No, it is quite impossible. We'll see that he gets there. Not. Noise of launch. In the meantime, can't we offer you some refreshments? Ah, monsieur, I have the long journey. I don't eat, I don't drink. Steward enters left. Oh, you don't, eh? That's too bad. Perhaps you'd like a smoke. Steward, take this gentleman below and see he has everything he wishes. Yes, sir. This way, please, sir. Going left, exit left second. Barget to Mac. Thank you very much. Following Steward, turning. You will please tell Mr. Brewster I am here the moment he come. Yes, we'll tell him. I thank you very much. Au revoir. Exits, left second. Mac, after a pause, looks at Bragdon, shakes his head. Can you beat it? Now, do you think he's dippy? Bragdon sits on deck top. I don't know what to think. How can we prevent him meeting the Frenchman? We might throw the Frenchman overboard. I can't think of any other way. Launch heard. Mac runs up. Looks off left third. Here's Monte's launch now. Crosses back down left center. Captain, two sailors, cross right. Three to left third. Bell, one, two, one. Stop launch. Now listen, don't let Monte know we found this out. First, show him your statement. And if that doesn't bring him to his senses... We'll tell them all what he's trying to do, and have everyone refuse to go with him. He'd probably go without us. Then we must find a way to stop him. How? Oh. I don't know yet. Shh. Monty, off stage. All right, boys, thank you very much. Good night. Enter Monty, up left. Hello, boys. Has a stranger come on board? Who? Why, a Frenchman, with a face and a nose, etc. Bragdon, cross to Monty. Well, here's something very important. Shows statement. Nothing could be more important. He crosses up left center. Yes, it is. Here's your statement to August 1st. Monty comes back down. Sailor lowers, owner's ashore light. Go on. The items are... Never mind the items. How much have I got left? That's what's worrying me. Just about half what your grandfather gave you. Great Caesar's funeral. Five hundred thousand, and here it is the 10th of August. Less than a year since you began your uh, business? Not much less. Only a month and a half. Don't forget that. It would have been a great deal worse than it is now if you hadn't had that wonderful look at Monte Carlo. Monty puts his hands on his forehead and winces. Of course. The $250,000 you won helps to... Boys, please, hold on. Do me a favor, will you? Never mention Monte Carlo to me again. But think what you won. I don't want to think. 
I'm a sick man. Makes me feel like a common gambler. Monty, don't you realize that it won't do to go on spending money this way? You bet I realize it. I've got to find some other way. Bragdon crosses up left center in disgust. If you keep this up, you will go broke in no time. You haven't very much left now. I haven't, eh? Haven't much left? I've got oceans, that's all. Just oceans of it. Enter left second, Barge. Come center to Monty. Ah! Ah! Mr. Brewster, I am so glad again to see you. Glad to see? Well. They embrace. Well, what luck? It is all right. Good for you. The mayor is consent. Hurrah! You must get to Albariz in two days, or it's too late. Two days. Sail at daylight. Make it in a day. Enter in order named from cabin left. Vanderpool, Mrs. Dan, Subby, Miss Drew, and Miss Armstrong and Peggy. Mac and Bragdon come down stage. They form a solemn procession. Vanderpool has large document. At first the mayor he do not believe. Monty, seeing people enter, to Barge. Shh! Barge crosses right. Monty to those coming on. Halt! Hello, what's this procession for? Monty, your guests have all decided they want this cruise to end. All right, we're going to end it. Hurrah! Hurrah. Home at last! last. Home at last! last. Finally we're going home! Bully for you! Home at last! Home at last! Vanderpool tears up petition. We're going to end it in a blaze of glory. What are you yes. talking about? What do you mean? Time to what? go home. What's he thought of that? What do you mean? We'll never, never get, get home. home. We'll, we'll, we'll never home. get home. Just a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present my dear friend, Monsieur Barget, who has just come to us from the mayor of Alberis. Mac, aside. Brag, we're in for it now. I've got a great surprise in store for you. I have Italian blood in my veins. What? 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 In honor of his birthday, and we are to be the guests of honor. Oh, no, what's no, this? Oh, come on, what's this? Come on, come on. I refer you to Monsieur Roger. Well, is this way? You see, tut tut. Just yes or no. Are we or are we not to be the guests of honor? Barja, bowing and laughing. Ah, we. Yes, are we? Ah, we. Oui. That's what I said. We are. <laughs> we are. Then you see? <laughs> we are. Oh, oh let's see here. Come on, Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. Now, Cut it. 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 Now, wait until you hear what is to take place. Bargy tells me that the parade will be the most gorgeous pageant seen in years. All the streets will be paved with roses. They're going to have 160 carloads of spaghetti. Confetti. Confetti. Pardon. For Subby, there will be hundreds of beautiful dark-eyed dancing girls. I'm for that. Peggy goes left center to rail. I thought you would be. For Mac, baseball game in the afternoon, prize fight at night. For Miss Armstrong. Ah, uh, where is Miss Armstrong? Janice steps down. Ah, yes, for Miss Armstrong. They're going to have a nice, friendly, platonic bullflight. Mac and Bragdon are whispering in each of the guests' ears, and they are exiting very quietly left second. If I may explain... You can't explain. You don't speak English well enough. Now, shall we accept the mayor's very kind invitation, sub? Then that's settled. We sail at daylight. The Royal Opera Company at Milan will give a special performance, in Italian, of Uncle Tom's Cabin. If I may explain... Shut up! 
Now, shall we or shall we not all? Turns, finds guests gone. Where have they all? Monty, your guests are going to hold a little meeting in the cabin. All right. What is it about? Well, this time it's a little surprise for you. Mac, to Barge. Won't you come below, sir? Certainly, with pleasure. I say, Barge. We? Oui? Monty, aside to him. Whatever you do, don't talk. Certainly. Eight bells. All are off except Peggy. Peggy! Yes? You are not going below just yet, are you? No, I was only going... Yes, I know, that's what you always do, ever since we've been on this cruise. You've managed it so we are never together. We are together now, aren't we? Starts to exit. Yes, I know, but you were going. Why, not going? Yes, you were. I just saw you move. Don't go for a moment, Peggy. I want to ask you a question. Won't you sit down? Yes, if you wish. Thank you. Places chair left center. She sits. What is it you want to ask me? I want to know if it's my squandering of money that has made it different with us. How made it different? I don't know. Before this money came, I used to think you cared. I... we... Peggy, I can't bear to have you avoid me. I know you think I've been acting like a fool and a crazy man. But you see, I've been up against a game that's... Well, that is, I've been trying to do something. You see, I have to... Sp it's a terrible difficult thing to explain something that you can't explain, isn't it? Well, I promise you one thing. As soon as this carnival is over, there will be no more squandering of money. Sits on stool on her right. Do you mean that there will be nothing left to squander? Well, that's one reason. Peggy, tell me, why did you come on this cruise? Music on stage. Because you said you wouldn't go unless I came. And you wanted me to go? Yes. On this yacht? Peggy nods her head. You did, eh? Yes. Why? Because I wanted you to get away from New York. From certain things. What things? Oh, I can't tell you. Let's talk of something else. All right. Like to talk about the weather for a few minutes? Beautiful night, isn't it? Everything peaceful and still. Just as soon as this carnival is over, we are going home. Do you know, Peggy, whenever I say home, I always think of your home and your mother's home. The happiest days of my life were spent there. Do you remember the attic? Yes. The cubby hole and how we used to read all of our optic together and play keeping house. You were father and I was mother. Remember how you used to make tea? And you drank. Yes, delicious, wasn't it? Made of hot water, milk, and sugar. Remember the day I smoked old Hendrick's pipe and you promised not to tell Mother? Gee, I was sick. But I'd be willing to be sick a thousand times, Peggy, if we could only go back to that little attic again and be kids for just a few hours. Rises, crosses up left center, then back and kneels on her left. Peggy, do you remember what we used to say we'd be when we grew up? We used to say a great many things. But the thing... Was there a the thing? Yes, we used to say that. Continues as if afraid to say it. When we grew up, we'd be married. And then we grew up, and now we see things differently. Yes, I know, but I shall never see the thing differently. Don't. I've tried not to tell you, but I can't help it, Peggy. I love you. I do. I do. He starts to take her in his arms. She rises and crosses right, speaking. You must not say that to me. You must not. Monty rises left center. Why, you know you mean everything in the world to me. What's on your mind, dear? Why won't you tell me? Is it something about New York? She starts. It is. Oh, tell me, Peggy, please. Please. I can't tell you. Why, you have a perfect right to interest yourself in stocks, theaters, operas, anything. 
operas. Oh, Peggy, why, you can't mean. You think I... She nods. Oh, you're terribly mistaken. Why, I only produced that opera because... I can't tell you, but I will soon. I'll tell you, I'll tell everybody. Peggy crosses to him. I hope you can. I hope you will. You mean that you could care for me then? I don't know. Stop music. Barbara Drew enters left. Miss Gray? Oh, I beg your pardon. First officer enters from right third. Pardon me, Mr. Brewster. The captain wishes to get underway at once. It looks like a bad storm, sir. Shh. Two ladies. Pardon me. First officer points to chart room right first. First officer opens door. Monty exits. First officer follows. Barbara comes down to Peggy. Have you heard what's going on below? No. It's too awful. The men are going to mutiny. Mutiny? I mean, they will try to take the boat into their own hands. They think Mr. Brewster is insane. Impossible. They have found out from the Frenchman that he intends to pay all the expenses of this carnival. Mr. McLeod thinks it will cost all he has left of his fortune. Oh, I wish I had never come on this horrible cruise. These frightful extravagances will reflect on us all. When I think that only a few months ago I might have been foolish enough to marry him, what a lucky escape. It shows that one can never be too careful. How did the men find out that Mr. Brewster wanted to marry you? Why, they haven't found out. Then why do they think he's insane? Do you mean? Peggy rises. I mean that Mr. Brewster is our host and has entertained us royally. If we criticize him behind his back, we do far worse than he... We insult him. I didn't know before how much he meant to you. Then I'm glad you found it out. He means a great deal to me. Miss Armstrong enters down second. Now we'll change the subject if you don't mind. Will one of you girls come down and play me a game of pinochle? Exit Miss Armstrong and Peggy left second. First officer off right third. All ready to get underway, sir. Very good. Heave short. Mac, off left center. Captain, can I have a word with you? Mac and Bragdon enter from left second down as the ladies exit up left second. They join Vanderpool and Captain, who have entered. Please don't interrupt me now. We're getting underway. We must speak to you. Captain comes down a step. No time now, sir. We're going to get a gale from the southwest. I can't be caught on a lee shore. Gives orders. It's important that you hear us now. We'll only detain you for a moment. Captain comes down. Well, sir? Captain, we want you to sail for New York. New York? When? At once. Can you do it? Certainly I can. Is that what Mr. Brewster wants? That's the trouble. We think he's mentally unbalanced. Captain looks. Why? From things which have happened. We have got to take the matter in our own hands. Mr. Brewster is my chief, sir. And we are his friends. He must be kept from going to Aberisi. It will ruin him if he gets there. If Mr. Brewster orders me to sail for Aberis, I must do it. But I am his private secretary. If I give you orders from Mr. Brewster, can't you carry them out? I can unless he countermands them. He won't countermand them. We'll guarantee you that. Very well. You order me to sail for New York? I order you to sail for New York. Very good. Crosses up left. Exits left third. Now it's up to us to get Monty out of the way. He must be kept away from the captain. We'll speak to him. Beg him once more. If he refuses, we'll lock him up. Ah, here he comes. 
Monty enters right second, crosses center left. Monty, we want to speak to you. I've got to see the captain a moment. We wish to talk with you first, please. Monty, center, looking at him. Why, certainly. Only we are getting under way, and I want to give the captain sailing orders. He has his orders, Monty. Who gave them? I did. He is ordered to sail for New York. That's a bit cheeky, don't you think, Bragg? I'll settle it quickly, though. Starts left. Mac, stopping him. Just a moment. Guests enter from up left second. Now see here. Do you fellows think you can improve on my plan to go to the carnival? Yes, old man. We think it will be an improvement to cut it out. Oh, do you, eh? Listen, Monsi, you've given us a wonderful trip. We are all grateful, but now we've had enough. But it'll only last a week, and we'll all enjoy it. No, Monty, we don't want to go. Mrs. Dan, I'm very sorry. But it's too late now. We've accepted the invitation. I ask you all to go as a favour. And we ask you, as a favour, to give it up. I can't, Bragg. We've got to go. You are not going to crowd your entertainment down our throats against our will, are you? Now see here. I don't call this playing fair. I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances. But I've got a particular reason for wanting to attend this carnival. I think you ought all to come with me. We found out from your agent that you are arranging this carnival yourself. And that you are going to stand all the expense. It will ruin you, and we don't propose to let you do it. Now look here, Mac. This is my money and not yours, and my business and not yours. Now drop it, please. It is our business, Monty, to the extent that we refuse to go with you. Monty, looking about at them, at last singles out Peggy and keeps his eyes fixed upon her. Is that the way you all feel? Yes. 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 Monty continues to look at Peggy. We all want to go home, Monty. First thunder, very light. Very well. Home it shall be. Good. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. The yacht will drop me at Alvarez and then take you to New York. I'm going to hold that carnival if I have to hold it all by myself. Now excuse me, please. They seize him, Monty struggling for a moment. Take your hands off me! Take your hands off me! Peggy starting forward. Oh, don't! Mrs. Dan detains her. She covers her eyes with her hands. Open that door! Break the bell wire! Get the key! What are you going to do? It's up to us now, Monty. The captain has orders to sail for New York. We are not going to let you countermand them if we can help it. It's for your own sake. Monty, struggling with all his might. Boys, you don't know what you're doing. Take your hands off me. Monty, please go. Please go for my sake. Monty stops struggling. All right. The boys release him. He looks at Peggy and quietly exits into chart room right second. The door is quickly closed and locked by Sailor. Loud crash, storm. Ladies all exit left second, screaming, except Peggy, who goes back of mast left. Serves him damned well, right? Jingle, whistles blow, sails. We'll never forget this, boys. Bell, thunder and lightning, wind blows, storm increases. First officer comes down from left. Captain enters left third with steward. Put out deck lights. Steward does so and exits right first. On deck there. Aye, aye, sir. Bring to the chains. Aye, aye, sir. Secure all boats for sea. Aye, aye, sir. Get ready the storm sail. You must go below. We are in for a gale. Cross stage to right and goes up to bridge. Go ahead, fellows. I'll guard the room. No use while this storm lasts. You'd be blown overboard. Sailor puts up red side light. Storm increases. They exit right. Steward enters right. Storm at its height. 
He locks cabin door. Peggy sees him. She rushes to him, speaks in pantomime. Stewart tries to have her go below, then gives her bunch of keys and exits right. She rushes right to door, unlocks it. Monty comes to door in shirt sleeves, all in white. Storm subsides a little for dialogue. One sailor swings on stage from cabin entrance by rope left. Others enter and clear deck. Storm at its height. Crash. Peggy! Captain Perry! Captain Perry! No, Monty! Captain Bridge. Well, sir? We sail for Abris. No, no! For Abris, Captain, those are my orders. Abris it is, sir. Crash. No, Captain, please. No, no, no. I had to give that order. I understand what you've done. They were trying to save you, and I released you because I couldn't bear to see you made a prisoner. What will you think of me? Peggy, you don't understand. I understand what you've done. It was shameful of you. Shameful. Shameful. Jingle. Exits. Left second. You don't understand. Bells. Captain, in speaking tube on bridge. Bertram, Bertram. What's the break? Send him up. Descends ladder. Sailors run across deck. What's the matter? Pardon me, Mr. Brewster. We've got a break of some kind. Bertram goes aft, followed by sailors. Quartermaster comes back. Sailor, running from left first to bridge. The rudder is broken, sir. Captain, to first officer, who follows from left first to right third, on run. How bad is it? Hmm, don't think we can make repairs outside of a dry dock. Bad as that? Take the bridge, Bertram. I'll see for myself. Exits, left third. Bertram, what's the trouble? We've lost our rudder, Mr. Brewster. We're helpless. Helpless? I've got to be in Aberys in two days. Mac and Bragdon enter left second. That's impossible, sir. Goes on bridge right. Monty follows him. But Bertram, I tell you, I've got to be there. Bert. Crash. Rudder broken, helpless, I've lost. I've lost. How did you get out? What's happened? Everything has happened. We're helpless. Now look here, you fellows. You were giving orders. Go on giving them. Sail for New York or hell or anywhere. I'm through. Voice. Off stage, right center. Sail ho! First officer on bridge. Where away? Ship comes on right. On starboard bow. Boys, look, a ship. We can get a tow. To quartermaster, who enters right third, followed by sailor. Oh, mister, what's the signal of distress? Fire a cannon, sir. Fire that cannon, Bragg. What else? Hoist the NC signal of distress and turn the searchlight on it. Get those signals. Sailor gets them from chart house. Monty to another sailor indicating rope at masthead right. Turn the searchlight on those signals. Sailor salutes and exits to bridge. Gun is fired. All scream. Sailor and Monty have tied signals. All enter when cannon is fired. Captain enters, rushing down from left third. Stop! What the devil is that for? There's a boat over there. We are signaling that ship. But that's a distress signal. Well, we're in distress, aren't we? I know damn well I am. We are perfectly safe, sir. I can rig a jury rudder and sail her in within a week. A week won't do. Man alive, don't hoist that signal. Why? If they come in answer to that, they can claim salvage. What's that? Salvage! Salvage! The entire value of this yacht! Five hundred thousand dollars! What? You mean to say I'll have to pay five hundred thousand dollars? Yes, you'll have to pay. Monty pulls signals up vigorously. Don't hoist that signal, for God's sake! Rushes to Monty. Monty, face suddenly lighting up, pushes him back. Grabs club, hoisting signals rapidly. The signal is answered from tramp steamer. Now, now, Mr. Jones, come with me. Curtain. End of Act Three.
Act 4 of Brewster's Millions by Winchell Smith and Byron Ongley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4. Scene. Set same as first act. Ottoman and all furniture is covered with burlap covers and piled up stage, except settee, which sets left, below arch, also covered. Several large packing boxes about, also. Cards. Sol J. Wilson, auctioneer, pinned on everything. Kitchen table right with packing box before it. It is 20 minutes before 12 noon on September 23rd, one year after the first act, Monty's 26th birthday. A subdued funereal atmosphere permeates. Lights full up, white foots. Border, side lights, amber. Olivet, off left. Mac, cross right third, enters with ledgers, left third, downstairs. Bragg! Bragg! Bragdon enters from right. Well, what do you want now? I want to show you about this ledger. Some of them won't believe Monty's crazy. Miss Gray won't have it for a minute, but wait until they see this. Bragdon, crossing to Mac. What's wrong with it? Wrong? Why, it's all upside down. Look here. He has placed everything he's spent to his credit. Notice what he has charged himself with. Lumber and fuel misfortune. Fifty-eight thousand five hundred and fifty dollars. Monte Carlo education. Seventy-five thousand dollars. Polite. A racetrack error. Fifty thousand dollars. Do you mean to tell me that man's sane? That's the book he has always kept locked in his safe. Sits on table right. Say, Bragg, listen to this item. Credit. Losing my best friend and breaking his heart. Thirty-five thousand dollars. Nopper Harrison. I always thought Monty knew what became of him. Whenever Nopper's name is mentioned, Monty closes up like a clam. Puts book back with others on large box upright. Enter Rawls, left. Mrs. DeMille, Miss Armstrong. Enter Mrs. DeMille and Janice, left. Rawls exits left. How are you, ladies? Hello, boys. What's up? Is Van here? No, he isn't here. Bragdon, right center, rises as they enter. Thank you so much for coming, ladies. We don't mind coming. But what's happened? It's a mournful place to ask you to, but Mac and the rest of us thought that now everything of Monty's is gone. Is there nothing left? Absolutely nothing, Mrs. Dan. It's taken the last penny to pay that salvage. Well, we thought that, with all New York guying him, it might help a little to show that we still want to be his friends, if he will let us. Mrs. Dan, cross as left, sits on settee. Of course we do. He's acted like an idiot and doesn't deserve any sympathy. Janice sits up center on Ottoman left. But it's tough to keep away from him just because he's down and out. Well, Van says we all ought to try and help him some way. I've thought of getting up a subscription. Subscription? Yes. All of us who were on that yacht might contribute a little. Bragdon crosses up center to Janice. Van says he wouldn't accept any subscription. Mrs. Dan, sitting on settee, left. He ought to. If he'd paid all that salvage because he thought our lives were in danger, he should allow us to show our gratitude. Of course he should. He has to leave this house today, and every blessed thing in it has been sold, so he will have no place to sleep. Dan says there's a way to help him, and that he might accept. What is it? Well, this is his birthday. And Van says there is no reason why we shouldn't make him birthday presents. Why haven't we thought of that before? I will see Colonel Drew. He wants to do something for him. Monty did him a big favor once. 
and we'll get him things he can turn into money. Money? Why, if he turns them into money, he will have it all spent by midnight. I think not. He's had a hard lesson. Van says we'd have to be careful not to let him think it is because his money is gone. On, Van says, Bragdon leaves her and joins Mac downright. The repetition is getting on their nerves. Where is Monty now? Upstairs, locked in his room. He made Bragg and me promise to wait here. He didn't go to bed at all last night. Had people carting things away from the house all night long. I don't think he's had anything to eat for two days. Enter Rawls, left. Mr. Vanderpool. Enter Vanderpool, left, goes center. Janice rises. Hello, everybody. I thought I'd find you here. Shakes hands with Janice. Oh, I saw Monty this morning. All turn to him with exclamations. He dashed in, threw me a month's salary, and made me give him a receipt for it. Takes salary envelope from pocket. Why, dearest, you took money from him when you knew he hasn't anything left? Couldn't help it. He had his receipt and was gone before I knew what it was all about. Mrs. Dan rises, takes envelope from Vanderpool. Well, you can turn that money over to Janice and me. What? This is his birthday, and we are going to make him presents. Bully, I'll go with you. They all move left. No, you won't. You hunt up Colonel Drew. Bragg. Can you see Subby and Gardner? Mrs. Dan and Janice exit left. What shall I say to him? Oh, I'll explain that to you. Come on. Bragdon exits after ladies left. Janice comes back in archway left. Archie, dear. Vanderpool turns. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Exits left. Archie, dear. Bah. Bragdon at Arch, upper left. Goodbye. Mac and I will go shopping too, just as quickly as Monty comes downstairs. Say, Bragg, if we bought that fellow a nice comfortable room in Bloomingdale's, it would do more good than birthday presents. I don't understand it. He acts like a crazy man, but somehow I can't believe it. No, you and Miss Gray won't believe it until he kills somebody. But you just notice him carefully and... Monty is heard on stairs, Bragdon warningly, pointing left third. Hush, here he comes. Mac crosses upper right center, Bragdon stays left. Enter Monty with receipts downstairs, has sign marked sold on back of coat, places bundles on table right. What have you got there? A million dollars worth of receipts. Here, boys, sign for these salaries, will you? Takes two salary envelopes from pocket. Now see here, Monty. We don't want to take these. Boys, please remember our agreement. I know I've led you fellows a devil of a dance, but you can all have your liberty now. Brewster's business is at an end. Thank God. Amen. Now, you won't refuse to take these, will you? Van took his and receipted for it. Yes. But we don't. Mac crosses to him. Never mind, Bragg. This is his birthday. We'll take it, Monty. Crosses left. Monty handing them salaries. That's the idea, boys. Just sign here. Indicating receipt, he goes up to Ottoman Center, sits. Bragdon has fountain pen. They sign. Bragdon, after he has signed. Are you going out, Monty? Not until after twelve o'clock. You can bet on that. Here are the books you wanted. Brings books from box upright and places them on receipts. Now everything has been turned over to you. Bragdon and Mac cross left quickly. Thanks. What's your hurry? We have an errand, but we're coming back again. Goodbye. So long. Bragdon and Mac exit left. So long. Sees cuff buttons, calling. Oh, Mac! Mac! 
Mac enters left. Monty has crossed down right center. Mac. Mac crosses to him. You always admired these cuff buttons. I want you to have them. Gives Mac links, which he has taken from his shirt. That's all right, old man. Exits left. Monty, at table right, leaning on receipts. Broke and lonesome. I'd like to find the man who says spending money's easy. Well, maybe they'll think differently of things soon. Enter Rawls, left. There's a man here with a package. Monty, going to Rawls quickly. Don't let him in. But he says it's a birthday present, sir. I don't want a birthday present. Have you got that gun I gave you this morning? Yes, sir. If anybody attempts to buy you with a package, you shoot him. Shoot him on sight. Goes to Rawls. Yes, sir. Rawls exits left. Monty goes to Ottoman again. Enter Trixie left. I knew you were here, so I just walked right in. Offers her hand. Shaking hands. I've been trying to see you ever since you arrived. You're different from most people. They've been trying to avoid me. Won't you? Hesitates, then indicates box right. Sit down. Thank you. Sits on box right. You're looking well. You've only seen me once before in your life, so I don't consider you a very good judge. Monty, sitting beside her. I know if you look well, even if I haven't seen you. Well, we won't fight about that. I came to ask you a question, and I don't know how to begin. Why not ask it without thinking how to begin? I've been reading the papers lately. Indeed. And I've seen in them what Mr. Smith calls some very unfavorable comments about you. Snubby puts it mildly. They say you have lost all your money. They're mistaken. I haven't lost it. I've spent it. Is everything gone? Everything, except what I've got on. And that reminds me, my hat and overcoat. Goes to Ottoman, brings hat and coat, places them on table, pauses, looking for a moment at coat, then sits. Trixie, after he is seated. It doesn't surprise me. I knew you'd do it. That's more than I did. I haven't been so foolish. I've saved some. I congratulate you. And it's coming in faster than I can spend it. Gee, that's an awful feeling, isn't it? I know what that means. I've been through it. Mr. Brewster, you did everything in the world that money could do for me. Why did you do it? Well, I didn't do it to have you ask questions after I had done it. Then I won't ask any more. What I came to tell you was that I have about $15,000 lying in the bank, and I want you to take it. Monty, jumping up and quickly backing away. I beg your pardon. I cannot take it. Please don't be foolish about it, Mr. Brewster. I don't need it. Besides, it's really yours anyway. Forcing paper upon him again. Shh! Please don't let anybody hear you say that it is mine. It's yours. I can prove it. I have your receipts. I'll see you in two weeks. Monty exits right running. Mr. Brewster! Well... Goes up to entrance right. Enter Rawls left. Miss Gray. Exits left. Enter Peggy. Peggy looks at Trixie, then turns away. Miss Gray. Yes. Standing left. I'm Miss Clayton. Standing right. Yes. Trixie coming center. I want to speak to you a moment. I think you can help me. I came to see Mr. Brewster, and he ran out of the room and left me. Will you help me? Peggy, crossing center. What is it you wish? I want you to induce Mr. Brewster to take back some of the money he has spent on me. Why? Because I've tried and failed. And I thought, perhaps, you would make him see that he ought to take it. I don't understand. Of course, you know what he has done for me. But he has acted so strangely. The night of the house party, when I met him, he told me that he thought I had a wonderful voice. And afterward, I found out that he had not heard me sing at all. 
when he offered to make me a star, I couldn't believe my ears. But when the company was engaged and rehearsals began, and I was given a beautiful apartment and jewels and gowns and servants and everything on earth I could think of, and more, I thought, as the showgirls say, that Mr. Brewster was taken with me. But he has never even called on me from that day to this. Why, he has given me the greatest chance a woman ever had, and I have never been able to say thank you to his face before. What do you mean? That you have never seen Mr. Brewster since... since... Taking step toward Trixie. Never since the housewarming. I expected for months that I should see him and get some sort of explanation. But none ever came. I don't think it needs an explanation. But some people have the wrong ideas about it. Of course, his real friends, those who know him well, like you and your mother, would never believe anything wrong of him. Peggy, approaching Trixie. No, his real friends would never believe. But, oh, Miss Clayton, I did believe. I did believe. Miss Gray. He told me it wasn't true, but I... I'm so glad you came here. I'll help you in anything I can. I'm glad you've had your chance, and I hope you'll be the finest, finest actress in the world. They embrace, and Miss Clayton cries. Trixie crosses to exit left, then stops. Well, I haven't returned the money, but I've done something. Goodbye. Exits left. Enter Monty right. Peggy! Monty, can you ever forgive me? Monty, stepping back and looking at her. Forgive you? For what? For believing. I mean, for not believing. I'm so ashamed. I'll never doubt you again. What do you mean? I've just heard. Crosses to him. You've heard? Is Jones here? He crosses left, quickly, looking off stage. No, no. A step down. What do you mean, just heard? He crosses to her. Miss Clayton has just been here, and I don't care what anyone says now. Ah, then you do believe in me, and you're going to stand by me and be the Peggy of the old days. Listen, Peggy, at this moment I haven't a penny in the world. I've spent a million dollars in a year. Do you care enough to stand by a poor, miserable devil at whom the whole world is laughing? I love you, Monty. Begin again. Forget this terrible year. We'll build a new life together. And you won't mind being poor with me? I can never be poor with you. I'm the happiest. Starts to embrace her. Enter Rawls with telegram on cigar box lid. Monty breaks away. A telegram for you, sir. I wouldn't let the boy in. And did you shoot him? Uh, no, sir. Monty, looking at telegram. Sure it's only a telegram? Uh, yes, sir. Opens telegram slowly, suspiciously. Well, well. I beg pardon, sir. Thirty cents charges. Certainly. Thirty cents? What for? Uh, the telegram, sir. Yes, of course, the telegram. Tell the boy to take it back. Puts telegram on salver. Peggy, opening purse. Monty, let me. I beg pardon, sir, if you'll allow me. Certainly, Rawls, and I'll give it back to you presently. Rawls, going left. Oh, pray don't mention it, sir. I don't mention it. I haven't said a word. I'll hand it back to you at one minute after twelve. Exit, Rawls, left. I hope it isn't bad news. I hate telegrams. Monty, handing her telegram. Don't worry, dear. Read it. Read it. Smiling. I think it's good news. Looking at telegram. Go on. Go on. Peggy reads. It says, Jones has disappeared. Looking at telegram. I've always thought this Jones, whoever he is, would be better out of the way. He... Why, Monty, is it bad news? Looking at Monty, putting head on shoulder. Monty, staring before him. 
I don't know exactly. Won't you tell me what it means? Monty, taking telegram, looking at it. Why, Peggy, if this telegram is right, it means that I am a pauper. Do you realize that? A pauper. I can't ask you to marry me now. It wouldn't be fair. Why not? Because I'm broke. What difference does that make? You did ask me just now, and you were broke then. I know, dear, but that was a different kind of broke. Crossing left in front of Satie. Whatever do you mean? Enter Rawls. Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison? Nopper? Not Mr. Nopper Harrison. Yes, sir. Enter Harrison, left. Exit Rawls, left. Monty, old man. Oh, but it's good to see you. Shaking hands, center. That goes double, Nopper. But you've come at a bad time. Peggy, how do you do? Why, what's the trouble, Monty? Made a fool of myself. Spent all my money. The papers told me that. Is the whole thing gone? Everything. Enter Rawls. Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant enters left. Grant, excited, out of breath. Oh. oh, how do you do, Mr. Brewster? Did you get my wire? Yes, sir, just now. Sorry to have frightened you. We found him. Found him? Peggy and Harrison down right center. There was a report he'd disappeared. But he's in New York and will be here at twelve o'clock. Monty, crossing quickly to Peggy. Do you hear that, Peggy? He's here. It's all right. Jones is here. Excuse me, Miss Gray, Mr. Grant, Mr. Harrison, Mr. Grant. Oh, this is good news. Center, going to Grant. Are your books ready for inspection? Yes, sir. All your money gone? Every penny of it. Absolutely penniless? Absolutely penniless. No article of jewelry, finance, visible or invisible asset. Not quite penniless. Thank heaven. Monty, allow me to return to you the $35,000 I owe you. Takes out money, hands it to Monty. You don't owe me anything, Nopper. Pushing Harrison back. Oh, yes, I do. It's been on my mind every moment since. Keep it on your mind a couple of minutes longer. What's the meaning of this, Mr. Brewster? Monty Center, trying to make light of it. Nothing at all. Mr. Brewster, what does this mean? Monty, slowly, with feeling. It means, Mr. Grant, that I've lost. Lost? Haven't you dissipated the fortune? No, sir. Here are $35,000 that refuse to dissipate. Now look here, Mr. Grant, I've made a hard fight to carry out this contract, and I've got to do it. What time is it? What time is it? Grant, taking out watch. Two minutes of twelve. Two minutes. Two minutes to spend $35,000. Look here, Mr. Grant, you've given me advice. Why won't you accept this as council fees? I'm sorry, Mr. Brewster, I can't do that. I'm retained by Jones as executor's counsel. Executor's counsel? Executor. Executor. Why, executors get fees, don't they? Yes. Isn't Mr. Jones the executor of my uncle's estate? Yes. What are executor's fees? Not less than one-half of one percent of the principal. One-half of one percent of seven million dollars... Why, that's $35,000, isn't it? Brewster, I follow you. Good. Well, then, there you are. Here are my books, my papers, and my receipts, faithfully and honorably kept. And here, Mr. Grant, are $35,000, Mr. Jones' fee as executor of my uncle's estate. Now, Mr. Grant, I haven't a penny in the... Places money in Grant's hand and backs away up center. My boy, I congratulate you. Rawls is heard off stage, expostulating with people who want to enter left. No, no, you can't come in. 
No, he expressly said, No, you cannot. No, go back. They break by him and enter left with packages, enter all with birthday presents. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday of the day, Monty. Monty. Offering presents. Wait, wait, not yet. Chimes strike twelve o'clock. Mr. Grant, let me introduce you to the finest lot of friends a man was ever cursed with. They've been trying to ruin me with birthday presents. Twelve o'clock. It's all right. Peggy, dear, I can ask you now. I'm rich. What do you mean? I mean, I made a contract to spend a million dollars in a year in order to get seven million left me by my uncle. You'll know all about it in a minute. He's here. Enter Rawls. Rawls, center. Mr. Swearington Jones. Yes? Uh, I wouldn't let him in. Well, you let him in. They run off left. Curtain. End of Act 4. End of Brewster's Millions by Winchell Smith and Byron Ongley.